Hello everyone, this is the last day of our short range wise app training. And uh, thanks for joining us for the last day of this training. And uh, the first talk of today is from Jeff Beck. He is going to talk about the current and the new uh, development of this app. Jeff, uh, please go ahead. You thanks, man. Ready? Sure, yeah, so um, over the past week, we've shown you, um, you know, the status of the app in terms of what's been developed uh, over the course of, it's been years now, uh, probably two years since we started, maybe more. Um, and so we thought we would also uh, give you a taste of what's currently uh, being developed um, and still being, uh, still undergoing uh, development and then future plans. Uh, for um, functionality that will be coming in the near future. So um, here's an overview of uh, what's currently ongoing and what I'll cover in this talk um, in terms of what's currently ongoing and then for future work that we're planning. Um, one is uh, we've been working on um, putting together an ensemble mode for the short range weather app. So it will provide users with an option to run uh, with as many ensemble members as they wish. Um, and I'll go over that here shortly. Uh, related to that is stochastic physics. So that was briefly touched on previously. I think uh, Lin Lin went over that uh, in the CCPP talk, um, but I'll show you how you can actually turn it on. Uh, and while it's unsupported, uh, it was included in the release. And so you'll be able to use that. SPP, which is a different kind of stochastic physics is being developed uh, as well. And we're gonna get that into uh, the short range weather app soon. Uh, we have deterministic and ensemble verification uh, that's now available. Uh, coupling work, uh, I'll go over a few different uh, additions that are coming online here shortly. Uh, not quite available yet. Um, I was unfortunately not able to get uh, additional information on the national water model coupling, but that will uh, include hydrological uh, coupling through uh, to give us information on um, uh, you know, river levels and flooding and things like that. Um, but I'll go into more detail on the other two coupling uh, as I was able to get additional information from uh, colleagues on that with FECOM and uh, the RFS CMAC uh, coupling. Um, another topic is creating a user do uh, defined domain. We went over that a little bit. Um, additional predefined domains, which I'll cover uh, that users can choose from the RFS system in general is uh, current and future development, uh, you know, undergoing rapid development right now, especially related to DA and cycling. Uh, the vertical coordinate user defined options, that's something we've been, it's been on our plate to try and get into the short range weather app for a long time. So um, that will be, uh, I'll cover that briefly. And then automated testing and continuous integration, which is something that uh, is being developed uh, for uh, the uh, short range weather app repositories. So, all right, we'll dive right in here. So ensemble mode. So like I said, uh, this was in the release, um, but it's currently unsupported, but it is available to users. Uh, it will be supported in the future. Um, users can define logical variables in the configure script. Uh, do ensemble is true or false. Um, and then uh, the number of ensemble members, uh, you just define as many as you want. And then these member directories are then created within uh, the cycle dir, um, which is um, uh, under the run directory. And then they all use this for now, they all use the same input director, uh, the input uh, name list. So they all run the same uh, more or less configuration, but in the future, that's something that we could add some variability to so they could use different uh, input name list files. Um, we do have individual pre-processing for each of the members, and this allows for uh, unique DA-based modifications and or um, IC perturbations. Um, and then all members currently use the same suite definition files, so the same physics. Um, again, this could be modified in the future to allow for multi-physics ensembles, uh, which is something that would be of interest uh, to test and compare to single physics ensembles. Uh, but I will add as well that there's quite a bit of development that's ongoing currently uh, at DTC and at NOAA GSL and, and NOAA EMC uh, with respect to the RFS and running in ensemble mode since the RFS is, is an ensemble system. And so a lot of these additional aspects to the ensemble mode will hopefully come back into the 
um, authoritative repository as you know the developments currently un being undergone and uh, undergoing in the um, in the forks of the short range weather app repository. So hopefully that will make it back into the authoritative repo soon. Uh, stochastic physics is again something related to ensemble mode, um, something that uh, we've been developing recently in a project that Jamie and I have been leading uh, to put stochastic physics into the FV3LAM. Um, and so part of that work uh, involved getting uh, three ad hoc schemes, SPP, TSHAM, and SKEB into, um, into the, the FE3LAM. And so that option is uh, available right now in the config script. Um, you can find documentation here that's been linked in. Um, Phil Pigeon in uh, PSL, Noah PSL is the one who originally got this working in the global system. And we worked with him to adapt it uh, to the FE3LAM. And so uh, here are the definitions for all three of those ad hoc schemes. I won't go into details about that. Uh, Linlin covered that. Um, but to turn them on, it's just these logical options in the config script, uh, do SVT, Shum, and Skeb. Um, and then there are additional settings in the config script uh, to control um, specifics about each of these schemes, the decorrelation length and time scales, the magnitudes, and, and uh, how often they're applied. Uh, and you can look at those details in the config default script um, which has all, again, config defaults has all of the options that are available to the user that you can um, put in your own config script. So that information is in there with some um, inline documentation. But if you want more specific details, I would go to the official online documentation to, to find that. Um, we are, again, in the project that Jamie and I are, are working on, we're, we're developing SPP for the FV3LAM. And so that will go in the short range weather app here soon. Uh, that's a little bit different than the ad hoc scheme. So instead of applying perturbations after uh, the physics call, these perturbations actually are targeted within the physics schemes uh, for specific parameters. And so that's something that uh, we've been developing currently for the wrapper physics suite. Uh, it could be adapted for any physics suite, any parameterization. Um, but right now it's, uh, it's in you know, Thompson microphysics, in RRTMG, in, in the RUC LSM scheme, and MYNN, PBL and surface schemes, uh, and gravity wave drag for GSL gravity wave drag. So those, those are coming soon and should be within the short wish weather app develop branch in the near future. Um, another part of that project is getting um, verification into the app. And so um, both deterministic and ensemble-based verification uh, using Met Plus are now in the Short Range Weather app. They were added through PRs in the last couple of months. Uh, we have uh, JJob and EX scripts uh, that are part of the, those are those are just tasks that run parts of uh, the workflow uh, are included to uh, pull the observation data. So. Uh, CCPA, precipitation data, MRMS, which is things like reflectivity, um, and then NDAS observation files, which is your traditional temperature, wind, uh, things like that. You can tell the workflow to pull those for you for the dates you want. Uh, and then to, you can run the MetPlus tasks, um, which are grid stat, point stat, and ensemble stat. I won't go into details on those, but there's plenty of documentation for, for MetPlus available. Uh, online to explain what those do. Um, and if you have your own observation files and you don't need to pull them or you don't need to tell the workflow to pull them, you can stage them uh, and tell the workflow where they are. So uh, that option is available as well. Uh, and then there are configuration files for MetPlus uh, so that users um, can modify the variables that are, are, are verified. Uh, you can modify the metrics uh, that are used, the thresholds, uh, categorical um, verification, and then uh, the accumulations as well, uh, among other things that you can, can modify. So all those are available in the app uh, now in the develop branch, so users can take advantage of that now. Still unsupported, but hopefully will be officially supported to the community uh, in the near future. All right, so we'll move into some of the coupling here. Um, so I want to thank uh, David Wright for providing some inf information on the FECOM coupling. Uh, from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, a uh, NOAA lab, GLURL. Um, and the FECOM model is it's a lake hydrodynamic model, and um, it provides uh, surface uh, boundary conditions over lakes for um, surface temperature and ice conditions. And right now, um, it's being used to initialize the Great Lakes within the short range weather app, and eventually this is going to be operational in the RFS. Um, and FECOM 
in turn uses uh, information from the shortage weather app and eventually from the RFS to drive its own model. And so uh, this is uh, currently available in the shortage weather app. You can turn it on for the Great Lakes um, for specific predefined domains currently. Hopefully we will have that um, for other domains in the future. Uh, but this coupling was already implemented in, in Herbie 4 uh, with a focus on improving uh, lake representation in the atmospheric model uh, for better lake effect snowfall forecasts. And there have been quantitative studies done that has shown that that has indeed improved the lake effect snowfall forecasts um, using this coupling techni technique. But it also improved near shore uh, wind environments in the summertime cases. So that's a really positive outcome there. Um, so again, the tools are available to use this if you wish. Um, and the actual, uh, there's code available in UFS utils, which produces the, uh, the data necessary for the model. And then the config scripts, there uh, is a logical to turn this on. And then uh, uh, there's another uh, variable to define the path where you can find the FECOM information so the model knows where it is. Uh, future development is being done to, to, to allow for hourly updating of the uh, lower boundary conditions. Uh, from FECOM, so we'll have more rapid updates of, of the, you know, the lake uh, boundary conditions for the shortage weather app and uh, ultimately for the RFS. And another example of coupling that is currently being um, undertaken at EMC is uh, the RFS CMAC coupling, so air quality modeling. Um, and so I want to thank uh, Chan Hu uh, for providing uh, this information here. Uh, this is RFS CMAC is a combination of the air quality model plus the app. Um, it uses the, uh, the forecast model, which you can see down here on the right, which is your just general UFS weather model with the air quality model included. Um, and then for pre-processing of uh, air quality information, it uses uh, UFS utils plus the ARL Nexus system, which is the Air Resources Lab uh, NOAA Emissions and Exchange Unified System. Um, and there is a workflow, uh, RFS CMAC workflow, uh, using the free forecast, or at least just for the free forecast. It's been developed and tested successfully on the RFS Courser 13-kilometer domain over the CONUS. And uh, there is a DA workflow using RFS CMAC, which is currently under development. Um, and hopefully, uh, the updates to these workflows can be included in, in the generalized authoritative workflow in the future. And, and again, before I move on, I just want to mention that um, the National Weather Model is also being coupled. While I don't have additional information on that, again, it'll be a hydrological component, which will be coupled with the Short Ridge Weather App providing information on uh, river flow levels and, and flooding. Okay, um, another example of uh, current development uh, is uh, creating a user defined domain. So, uh, we did go over this during the training. Uh, Gerard's talk on defining, defining a new domain uh, went over this on Tuesday. Uh, so I'd refer you to that talk, uh, which is now available uh, online on the DTC training uh, website for additional information. Um, users can go in and add a new predefined domain uh, by modifying this, this set predefined grid parameters script. Um, Again, all of this information is in Gerard's talk, but I would just summarize and say, you know, it's best to use one of the existing domains as a template in that file and copy paste it, create your new domain name, and then supply the necessary information uh, for the ESG grid variables, for the, uh, the computational domain, and then the right component variables, which is your output grid, uh, which is um, WRT CMP star variables. Um, so both of those have to be defined. Um, and then we do have a goal in the future, hopefully, to develop some kind of easy to use plotting script so that users can provide, uh, you know, general lat long information and then uh, the script will output the optimal right component uh, settings for a given computational domain. So hopefully that will be available in the future to ease what's required for a user to create their own domain. Um, so speaking of domains, uh, we have additional predefined domains that are not necessarily officially supported, but are available uh, for users to run uh, in the develop branch. And uh, they're included in the release, but they will be supported uh, eventually. And here's a list of all the different uh, grids you can choose from. Uh, you can find those in the OSH directory and valid parameter values uh, file. And uh, in bold are the three officially supported grids that we have right now. Again, these are CONUS grids for three varying resolutions, but 
Um, if you wish, you could certainly try and run any of these others. Um, we have a subconus domain. We have Alaska domains in here. Uh, we have um, the uh, legacy EMC NAMNEST uh, domains, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam. We have HAVS domains in here. Again, that's the hurricane forecast system. Um, HAVS V0.A, we have, which is a um, Atlantic basin domain. It's really large, covers all the Atlantic hurricane basin. Uh, we have a, a 13 and a 25 kilometer option there. Um, we have uh, an old HER domain as well, a HER Alaska domain, I should say. And then finally, we have uh, the RFS North American domain, and that's um, nominally what's going to be implemented operationally in a couple of years for the RFS. We have two options, the official three kilometer domain and a, a coarser 13 kilometer domain to, to run a little bit faster because it is a, a huge domain. Um, and again, you can choose any of these by defining them in the config uh, shell script and Again, just to mention that the RFS North American three kilometer domain uh, is close to what will be operational. Can't say officially it's going to be what's what's going to be run uh, grid point per grid point, but it is close. And uh, this will replace all of the convection allowing systems that are currently uh, running but have stopped development. So the HER, the HER Alaska, Hawaii, uh, Caribbean, the RAPNAM, and the NAMNES. And here's an example of why we need it. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, first of all, it's great to be able to have a higher resolution over a much larger area uh, than we can right now. Um, but, uh, you know, for uh, stakeholder requirements, um, right now we've got this mess of grids that have to be delivered uh, to different stakeholders, you know, National Weather Service, the FAA, things like that. And this white domain is essentially what the new RFS three kilometer domain will look like, and it will replace all of these interior domains. and greatly simplify um, the operational suite, uh, among other things. So this gives you a taste of what, what it looks like and what it's going to eventually replace. Um, so yeah, this is all tied into the RFS and, and the RFS development. And I won't go into much more detail here because Jacob's got a whole talk on this coming up, so I'll defer to him. Um, but um, suffice it to say that the RFS is a specific configuration of the Short Range Weather App. It's based on the Short Range Weather App. Um, and efforts uh, are ongoing to focus on an hourly cycled uh, three kilometer North American domain. Uh, the CONUS domain is planned for rapid development since it will be much easier to test things on a, a three kilometer CONUS um, scale. Uh, and that, uh, that domain will eventually be included in the short range weather app. Uh, we're working on finalizing it and then we will go ahead and add it. Um, since it is slightly different than what the, the current three kilometer CONUS domain is that we have in the app. Um, there's extensive development going on um, at NOAA GSL and EMC on DA development with the RFS, um, specifically with GSI for the moment, although that eventually will move to JEDI in the future, um, using cycling with restart files. And um, so GSL and EMC are working together uh, in parallel on development on this work, coordinating, coordinating together. Uh, and then uh, the development's taking place in in, um, in forks of the app repositories. Um, so there is a framework that's being developed and worked on and iterated on right now to hopefully merge all of this development back into the authoritative repos in the near future. So that's, that's critical because we want to avoid uh, divergence of the code bases. And we also want to provide this uh, code to the community so that um, people like you who are attending today can run the RFS um, fairly easily um, on your own systems, on your own HPC. So again, uh, Jacob will hopefully, uh, will definitely go into much more detail on this next. So uh, another option is um, providing a user-defined vertical coordinate. So right now it's fixed. Um, the user coordinate, I'm sorry, the vertical coordinates in the short range weather app is you know, 65 level system um, and number of vertical levels, and they're they're fixed right now, and we, we just don't have an option for the user to um, easily change those levels. Um, and the way it works in, in the FV3 is that um, there are some vertical coordinate configurations that are hardwired into the model code. So, uh, in this atmosphere uh, routine, uh, and it's it's it depends on the number of levels chosen. So. In the name list, you define your number of vertical levels. And so the, the model will check that. 
it will go back into the code and it says, if, if this number of levels is defined, then we have these vertical levels set out uh, for those number of levels. And the other option right now is it can also be read in using a text file. So if you define a text file uh, with what's called these AK and BK values, which uh, Lucas went over in his talk, um, then you can also read in that text file that has all the levels in it defined for the AK and the BK values. So we want to make this user defined so that you can actually either provide your own text file with your own vertical levels or do something even more advanced, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a second. But just to go over uh, you know, what these AK and BK values are, and again, Lucas went over it. I won't go into much detail here, but they're essentially uh, coefficients that, that define or they help define the, the sigma coordinate and the, iso the full isobaric level. So again, we're using a hybrid coordinate, so it's a combination of sigma and isobaric levels. And um, this is as how you construct the full pressure levels here. It's a combination of the two times the surface pressure. Um, and uh, you can define the a and AK and the BKs for each of your vertical levels in a text file. And so the easiest thing to do would be just to provide a path in the config file for a text file that a user can define with these levels. Um, and then you would also define the number of vertical levels that you're using. Uh, in the nameless file, the other option, uh, which would be more advanced, but much more useful maybe, arguably, uh, would be to allow the user to define the number of levels they want within a certain depth of the atmosphere and then have external code compute the AK and the BK. So say you want X levels in the boundary layer, Y levels in the free atmosphere, and, and, and Z number of levels in the stratosphere and above all the way to the top of the model. And then the, the code would actually go in and compute the AK and the BKs for your defined number of levels. So that is one of our goals in the future among many, many goals. Uh, so it would be great to have that uh, additional aspect in, in the app for users to take advantage of. On the last but not least um, uh, example of work that's ongoing right now and, and will be continuing in the future uh, is automated uh, repository code testing and continuous integration. I want to thank Christina Holt for her contribution here, this information and this works. This is ongoing work right now uh, at GSL. And um, the goal, goal here is to automate build tests for the existing develop branch of the short-range weather app and the end-to-end -end workflow tests. So we actually do have workflow tests. We haven't talked about this much uh, in, in the current training, but there are, there's a test directory which has end-to-end um, -end examples of ways that you can configure the app and you can run the app. And so there's a, a goal here to automate a build test, which would run, for example, nightly. It doesn't have to be nightly, but it could be any frequency you someone would like um, to make sure that you can build uh, the code and, and run an end-to-end -end test to, and make sure it doesn't fail. Um, and they're, the tests are currently being done on the AWS parallel cluster via GitHub Actions and through the GitHub CLI to run uh, platform-specific tests on uh, specific, uh, no HPC right now, but it could be portable to, to any supported platform. Um, there's also uh, the goal to explore an option to containerize the workflow uh, for tests with Rakoto. And plans exist to, to set up a mechanism uh, to automate merging of the authoritative code into, for right now, the NOAA GSL forks. But this could also be uh, applied to any fork of any of the app repos. Uh, and it could also be used to update hashes as well. So if you have code that you're running on a specific hash and you want to update to a new hash, then this could be a way to automate that process. So. Uh, this is great work going on that we are really looking forward to to help us automate um, some of our testing and the build uh, to make sure we don't have to do this all manually in the future. So um, that's uh, all I have. And so I will open this up for questions. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, I didn't see any question coming from Slack. And there is also a comment from George actually about UFS utility. So it said the UFS utility repository has a utility to create your own set of AK and BK. So it's nice information to have. That's great. Yeah, I didn't know that. So that's, that's fantastic. So at least that, that option exists and we should get that uh, worked into the short range weather app. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, great. So, and uh, anyone, if you have questions or comments, please raise your hands or just to speak up. So oh, looks like Rajesh. Yeah, Jeff. So yes. can you please say something about the timeline for SRWC Mac? I can't specifically speak to that much. Is Chen Hu on? He was the one who provided the information and he can speak more to that or maybe Jacob. Okay. Maybe Jacob. <laughs> He'll okay. <get> to this. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I can't, um, I, I mean, I can speak in terms of operations uh, and that is scheduled to go in with RFS version two. Um, so the full connection there uh, from an operations perspective is, is farther out on the horizon. Um, obviously we'll need to have something that's, you know, development ready and, and whatnot ahead of time, but I can't speak to the timelines for that at the moment. Okay. So maybe would you recommend reaching out to GSL if we want to collaborate on testing the that that part as RWC man? Well, yeah, I mean that Chen Hu and Jacob are EMC actually, so um, you can you can contact them. I mean, we will I assume at GSL also be you know collaborating with EMC on that, but. Um, yeah, I would. You, yeah, you could start with them, and and uh, I'm not sure if anyone else is working on that, Jacob, uh, in your group. Yeah, I mean, there's a a pretty large group of folks. Not, I mean, not just EMC, but kind of spread across NOAA and <laughs> excuse mm -hmm. me, university collaborators as well that are working on, especially under the context of um, wildfire and pipe applications. So uh, again, I. I'd have to go back and, and look a little bit more thoroughly, but if, if there's some interest in, in finding a way ways to collaborate, we could, you know, send send one of us an email and um, you know, we can see about finding a little bit more information to help address your question. Thank you. Okay. So any more questions or comments? Okay, if not, actually we can continue our next speak talk. And uh, our next one is from Jacob. Jacob Colley, actually. Yeah, he's talking about RFS development that uh, right. Jeff already Perfect. mentioned here. Okay, Jacob, if you are ready, please go ahead. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we see that. It's good. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit here about RFS development. I feel like you all have probably, throughout the week, can probably piece a lot of this stuff together since there's been, um, it's been kind of, the, the theme has been sprinkled throughout, which is wonderful. Uh, so, uh, oh, before I get going, I really want to just acknowledge that I'm presenting this on behalf of the wider development team, which is, you know, it, it's a wonderfully collaborative effort. So that includes not just the Environmental Modeling Center where I happen to work, but also uh, NOAA GSL, NSSL, GFEL, NCAR DTC, academic partners. Uh, we also work closely with AOML as well. You know, this is indeed uh, under the UFS or Unified Forecast System umbrella that we've all been exposed to this week. Um, so meaning that, you know, other applications like HAFS and the GFS and anything else that falls under the UFS framework um, all has this nice opportunity to provide benefit uh, or side benefits um, to other applications since we're all under a common umbrella. So uh, as everyone here probably knows by this point, uh, the UFS is a community-based coupled comprehensive earth modeling system. And just to really, and I'm, you know, we're, we've been hammering this point, but I'll keep doing it because it's important, is that the UFS is the source system for operational NWP applications at NOAA. Uh, going forward. So um, that means that, you know, work that is done on the SRW app, which underpins the RFS system, uh, 
has a great opportunity to help improve uh, you know, future uh, operational numerical weather prediction at NOAA. So and that's just a, a wonderful thing. So I'll skip the rest of this because I feel like everyone's probably already aware of all these things at this point. And I'll get to um, a little bit more background and some motivating factors behind where we're going with RFS or the rapid refresh forecast system. So for those of you who are familiar uh, or you know, use uh, the operational regional uh, NWP systems that come out of NOAA, uh, you probably know that there are a lot of systems out there. So here's what that currently looks like at the moment. Uh, we have the global uh, systems of so GFS and GEFS. So run four times a day, global model, um, you know, and have a fairly long forecast horizon. We have regional applications <clears throat> running at about 12 to 15 kilometer grid spacing. And those are in the form of the rapid refresh, the short range ensemble forecast system and the North American mesoscale forecast system there. Then we have a whole set of uh, convection allowing applications. And those are all in the form of, uh, you know, the high resolution rapid refresh. So these are, you know, some of these are rapid updates like the HERT, um, and then some are a little updated a little bit less frequently like the high-res window application. So this is high resolution window advanced research wharf. Uh, the, now the FE3 limited area model is also running in operations. Uh, the NAMS uh, nest, the three kilometer nest, and another high-res window ARW uh, member. And the reason we call it a member is because uh, these things all combine to form a high resolution ensemble forecast system. And this was kind of, this came out of some great work that was done at the Hazardous Weather Test Spread Spring Forecast Experiment many, many years ago, where they had developed something called the Storm Scale Ensemble of Opportunity. And it really was an ensemble of opportunity. We had a handful of these convection allowing systems running at the time, and they thought, well, what if we combine them all and turn them into an ensemble, hence ensemble of opportunity. As it turns out, it worked really well, and we decided to implement uh, that as a part of the operational production suite, which is really just a post-processing uh, uh, applied to these ensembles. And as it turns out, it provides rather very good forecasts. And um, you know, one thing to note here is that you'll see this, and we've got three different dynamic cores up here, and they all have different sets of initial conditions and lateral boundary conditions. And of course, they all have different physics. And they cover a lot of different areas. So Jeff noted this on his talk, but the NAM and the NEST cover a variety of domains. Uh, so Alaska and Hawaii and Puerto Rico and CONUS and so on. Uh, RAP uh, and HER. So, you know, RAP has a very large hourly updated domain. Of course, the NAM has a very large domain as well. And then we have the high-res windows covering a variety of different domains too. It's a lot, okay? And that's what we're really gonna focus on here is everything that's covered in that blue area and where does RRFS come in? So, so this is where things currently look. And now we have the UFS and we're going towards a unified uh, approach heading forward. And this is what we want it to look like. And so this is where RRFS comes in. So if we're going from something like this, which is fairly complex, especially in the context of the regional suite to something that's much simpler. And so we're trying to unify everything that's in that blue circle on the prior slide into this uh, rapid refresh forecast system or RRFS. Sometimes we call it RUFUS. Okay, so what is it and what does it look like? So. Uh, it's rapid refresh forecast system. It's a UFS application for everybody here. This is underpinned by the short range weather app that you're all here learning about uh, this week. And so this is based on the FE3 dynamical cores, limited area model capability, rapidly updated. So uh, uh, doing an analysis at every hour and providing a forecast every hour. Uh, it's, it would be run at three kilometer grid spacing. 65 vertical layers, a hybrid 3D ENVAR data simulation system. We'll be using 36 members uh, in the ensemble Kalman filter piece to simulate the evolution of the background air covariance matrix from analysis time to analysis time. And then we'll be subsetting a set of those 36 members down to about nine members to do ensemble forecasts uh, at, at each hour. So the reason we have to do that and subset to a smaller grouping. It's just to conserve computational resources. You can imagine by looking at the domain there on the right, it's fairly expensive to run. Uh, on each slab, it's about 9 million grid cells. And uh, so, uh, you know, we'll be subsetting to nine members uh, for the free forecast piece. And we'll be divvying that up among stochastic and a multi-physics suite so that we can still maintain uh, good spread error relationships 
uh, convection allowing ensembles tend to be a little bit under dispersive and as a result um, you know it's it's a little bit uh, th th there's still a design challenge there um, and then every six hours so at the synoptic times we'll be doing forecasts out to 60 hours and then uh, forecasts out to about 18 hours or so uh, every hour so here's why we picked that large domain jeff kind of already went over this um, but just to kind of make that point abundantly clear uh, not it, it, it's it's you know where we're trying to unify all these systems together it also makes sense to try to cover all the domains um, at once and this does a couple things is one it simplifies the production suite considerably it also uh, uh, enables us to capture atmospheric phenomena um, you know that may benefit from higher resolution uh, that we may not have otherwise captured uh, using uh, domains that kind of hug the coastlines and focus over areas, uh, 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 land land areas uh, almost exclusively. So one, you know, we can capture uh, more satellite radiance observations. Uh, so those tend to be a little bit more voluminous over water, uh, owing to, you know, if they're a little bit more difficult to use over land for those who are familiar with uh, satellite radiance observations. Atmospheric rivers affecting the west coast of the United States will have better resolution for that. It also provides us more of an opportunity to capture uh, evolving uh, tropical cyclones as well. So those are a couple additional application areas that are sort of bonuses on top of the fact that it allows us to better unify all the, the, the variety of high resolution domains that we have out there. Uh, in addition, moving those lateral boundaries farther away uh, from North America, or at least the central portions of North America, will help uh, improve the forecast at the longer lead times as well, up to the end of, those, of that 60 hour period. Here are just some very basic, simple results that sort of show some of the benefits that we see from using that larger domain. So this is just uh, uh, the smaller CONUS domain on the top uh, and stats from the larger RFS domain on the bottom. Uh, uh, color shaded here is uh, bias corrected RMSEs for geopotential height. Uh, and so those brighter colors getting more to the yellows means higher errors. You just see as you move to the right and forecast lead time, the RFS domains are computed over the <clears throat> only over the CONUS area, by the way. So they are comparable, uh, but the errors tend to be uh, lower uh, farther out into the forecast. Again, just sort of confirming that yes, moving those lateral boundaries uh, farther away from the uh, interior of the domain uh, tends to help forecast a little bit. Uh, an expected result, but it's also nice to see that borne out in the statistics as well. So uh, just a little bit more information on our vertical resolution. So I mentioned that we uh, uh, decided to run with uh, 65 layers, which I think is 66 le levels. So I think I've got this, my nomenclature on here is perhaps backwards. Nonetheless, the point being is that this is an opportunity uh, when we're unifying to take a second look at our vertical resolution. And so this is an also a chance where you can use that uh, vertical uh, level generating code that's a part of UFS utils that was mentioned in the chat earlier. And that's actually what we used here to make these. Um, so a little bit of background, uh, current regional suite is between 50 and 60 levels. So the operational HER has about 50 levels. The operational NAM has 60 levels. Uh, they have different uh, model tops and so on. Here's what they currently look like in operations. If you look over on the right-hand side, the NAMS vertical level distribution is in this blue line and the HERS is in this red line, okay? And so you can kind of see that they have uh, different, um, you know, they preferentially favor certain areas uh, for increased uh, vertical resolution. And so uh, what we did here is took this as an opportunity to kind of say, okay, let's take a step back see if we can redefine our vertical resolution um, and, and make it a little bit better. So uh, what we did was, is we took the lowest model level from the HER, which is about eight meters above ground level. And that was chosen because uh, the HER team has found that having that mo lowest model level closer, a little bit closer to the surface really helps in the prediction of surface sensitive weather elements that are very important, things like two meter temperature and 10 meter wind and so on. And then we took the two millibar or two HPA top from the NAM so that we could better assimilate satellite radiances associated with those uh, channels that tend to be a little bit higher peaking. And then we also improve the resolution uh, aloft as well, which then also puts us on better footing or better foundation to assimilate satellite radiance data, which we'll be getting more of owing to that larger domain. Now for physics. Uh, so uh, based largely on the HER, 
so we wanted to pick or go run with a uh, suite that has a very good uh, performance history in terms of operational NWP as our first step forward in uh, the RFS system. And so you can see here, uh, this is what we're running with at the moment and currently in parallel testing at EMC. Uh, so the thompson Eidhammer microphysics scheme, the RRTMG uh, long and short wave radiation, a uh, unified gravity wave uh, drag for small scale and turbulent orographic form drag, no land surface model, although we plan to transition to NOAA MP, and that's a little bit of a discrepancy between uh, what is running in the short range weather app physics suite and what we're running in parallel right now. We're still using NOAA and we will be moving to NOAA MP. So in that context, the short range weather app, short range weather app is a little bit uh, ahead of us. Boundary layer be MYNN EDMF, MYNN surface layer, NSST for the SSTs. And then we're still working on getting the large flakes from FB compoled in, uh, in which we heard a little bit about that in a prior uh, presentation. And then we need to pull in also an England Lake model. So those things are still out there, but we will uh, planning to get those in for our RFS version one. Okay, data simulation. Uh, this is more my background and we've got a variety of tests going on at EMC and at GSL. Um, I'll focus on some highlights here for the EMC runs. We have three different systems currently running in real time. Uh, we have a cold started version, uh, just running over the North American domain twice a day. Uh, so this is kind of a baseline, uh, you know, without DA, so kind of just a way in which to, to measure against. This is initialized off the GFS. We have a DA uh, parallel test system uh, just running over the CONUS domain. You can see sort of what that looks like on the looks like on the lower right, and then we're also running a DA configuration over North America to to help uh, diagnose and develop initial capabilities uh, for doing data simulation over such a large high resolution grid. Um, you know where there are some growing pains and some optimizations and things that we're discovering along the way, uh, and that just gives us a nice way in which we can find figure out and address those and then compare them to the smaller domain uh, DA version and the large domain cold start benchmark. So everything that I'm gonna be showing here uh, on this slide uh, is, you know, has a very simple DA configuration. It's not yet to the full prototype end-to-end -end RFS with the 36 convection allowing ensemble members uh, as a part of the ENKF. What we have closely mimics the configuration that's in operations for uh, the North American mesoscale forecast system, uh, 12 kilometer parent domain and Alaska and uh, CONUS nests. So um, we're doing forecasts at zero and 12. We passively use the global uh, 80, 80, the full set of 80 ENKF members from the global ensemble system. It's a part of the hybrid cost function. Like I said, there's no three kilometer DA members yet. And we don't have any cloud or radar DA yet in our parallels, um, but that is under a rapid development. And then we're not doing any partial or catch up cycling type yet, uh, steps yet. So uh, what this basically looks like is we have a cold start six hour forecast from the GDAS or the global data simulation system. And then we do an hourly hybrid 3D ENVAR uh, DA cadence. So one hour forecast, run an analysis followed by another forecast and an analysis over the course of a six hour long period at the end of which we issue a long 60 hour three kilometer forecast. There's no ensemble forecast component in this at the moment, though there'll be more on that later. Um, it's just a, a deterministic forecast at this stage. So like I was saying earlier about larger domain meaning more in the way of satellite radiance observations, here's just a nice way of actually showing that. Uh, and here uh, we just have a simple data counts uh, by domain. And so this is over the course of that entire six hour long data simulation period I showed on the prior slide. And this just really kind of uh, demonstrates this effectively. So over the CONUS, uh, observations are primarily from conventional sources. Uh, now, for those who are not familiar with this particular type of nomenclature, conventional means things like radiosons, aircraft, uh, generally most in situ uh, type data, okay? So, and also like METAR and two meter temperature, uh, 10 meter wind and so on. OK, so in the blue here, you see that, you know, most of the observations that come into the DA system 
um, you know, are, are, are of, from conventional uh, sources. So not a whole lot in terms of the satellite data. Now, when we expand the domain considerably, it's the opposite is true. Uh, the North American domain has a 250% increase in assimilated observations just across the board relative to the CONUS domain and satellite data now make up over 75% of the observations that come in. Um, and so again, just kind of helping justify some of the domain changes as well as some of those changes that are behind adjustments to the vertical resolution. Now, let's talk a little bit about what the forecast ensemble will look like. So as I said earlier, it's a nine member forecast ensemble. And we also mentioned a, a little bit about why uh, the need for stochastic and multi, multiple physics. Uh, we're also planning to pull in lateral boundary perturbations from the uh, global ensemble forecast system. But the initial conditions, of course, will be coming from a subset of uh, the, the data simulation system, so a subset of those 36 members. Now the question, some may be asking why multi-physics? Um, so far, research and experience, especially in NOAA's test beds, so the winter weather experiment, the spring forecast experiment, and the flash flood and intense rainfall experiment, the results still show uh, that single physics CAM ensembles tend to be under dispersive. And that's at least for now. Um, with additional efforts uh, and, and our target uh, for, RF, for future RFS versions, we'd like to collapse, uh, and uh, collapse is probably not the best word for this, but unify around a single physics ensemble with stochastic perturbations. Um, there are compelling development reasons for this, as well as some scientific underpinnings that make that a more attractive long-term scenario. However, in the short term, we need to make sure that we have uh, good spread error relationships. So obviously, we don't want an ensemble that's just got a lot of spread for having a lot of spread sake, and it also has a lot of error. So we want to kind of keep uh, that ratio as, as optimal as possible and to be competitive with a high resolution ensemble forecast system which has also got diversity in dynamic core in addition to physics and initial conditions and all that uh, to stay competitive we need to find a way in which we can capture uh, and, and sample the, the, the uh, um, uncertainty and model error as best uh, we can for at least RFS version one and then hopefully we can improve upon that in subsequent versions. Okay, I've rambled on enough about that. Now let's talk about some of the testing that we've done so far. Um, uh, Christina Holt, who will be talking uh, later, uh, uh, will go into more detail on this, but we have a really exciting project uh, where we were able to demonstrate and then test out running a prototype forecast ensemble system. And here is our first uh, crack at this uh, with nine members. Uh, and you know we have initial and lateral boundary condition diversity from the GEFS and the uh, and the uh, deterministic GFS as well as physics diversity uh, with different physics suites based on boundary layer and microphysics as well as stochastic perturbations here. So this is kind of a snapshot, at least initial, of what we're kind of thinking this may look like. This is not necessarily definitive in terms of configuration in general, but um, more of a um, uh, just a kind of a, a an example, I should say and an opportunity to get an initial look at some statistics and, and numbers uh, associated with running a configuration like this. Now, it's nine members and we're running over uh, a domain that covers all of North America, which is a large area. We don't necessarily have, in terms of the supercomputing systems that are of conventional nature, or, 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 or rather, we sometimes call them on-prem, big systems installed in a data center that you know, NOAA has an affiliation with or whatever, uh, we don't necessarily have enough resources in any one of those individual systems to run a system like this uh, even once per day. And so uh, we have a project to that uh, kind of helped us out with this. And it was to port, deploy, and test a prototype system, but using cloud uh, high-performance computing environments. And so this involved porting and looking at nodes and instances and trying to figure out what's the best uh, price and performance uh, you know we can get um, also interconnect uh, making sure the networking between nodes is is what we need and, uh, a lot of other requirements and so we began testing this in January 2021 with the goal of being able to deploy this in the test beds from this past spring so both the spring forecast experiment as well as the flash flood intense rainfall experiment each of those runs are about a month and they kind of run somewhat back to back and they're kind of nice real-time environments where we can get a lot of really excellent feedback uh, and um, assessments from our collaborators. And so 
we ran this on the cloud. We also did a little benchmarking on the cloud and found that um, when, and, and we used AWS for this. And it was actually our benchmarking showed that it was about 15% faster than uh, one of our research and development uh, computing platforms uh, called Hera. And we kind of set things up and tried to minimize differences between the two configurations as best we could. So the spring forecast experiment, the real focus here is just to look at um, deep convection and associated and, and associated hazards and just looking at and evaluating and trying out new tools and new modeling capabilities uh, very much targeted towards higher resolution type applications or really what we're trying to do with RFS and the underpinning short range weather app as well. So here are just a couple examples. The operational benchmark is on the left with the high resolution ensemble forecast system. Again, multi that's a multi-physics, multi-die core, multi-initial condition, multiple lateral boundary condition uh, ensemble of similar size to the RFS system that we're running on the right. This is just to kind of show, uh, generally speaking, that when you look at ensemble probabilities, and in this case, it's updraft helicity. So we tend, tend to find that larger values of updraft helicity tend to correspond quite well to where we expect to have instances of severe weather. And in this case, it's uh, uh, hail, uh, severe wind, and, and tornado reports, which are what those little polygons are uh, there on the screen. So again, forecasts aren't the same, uh, but we're in the ballpark similar enough for these, this particular uh, forecast day during the spring experiments. This happened to be May 18th um, in Texas. Here's a different day. Uh, here we're looking at forecast probability of exceeding 40 dBZ. And uh, you can see observations are outlined in those kind of pink uh, uh, contours here. Where you can see the forecast ensemble probability of exceeding 40 dBZ. Um, again, somewhat similar forecast orientation, uh, maybe speed of you know, where we expect the um, maxima of the probabilities to be is a little bit different between the two. Nonetheless, they're both in the ballpark, and this is a great initial result. So this is the first time we've run an ensemble uh, like this uh, with the RRFS framework, especially over that entire North American domain. And we were doing it all in real time on the cloud and delivering it uh, uh, through cloud services as well for uh, the test beds to look at. And so uh, we're still digging through the statistics on this. And so um, we'll be learning a much, much more uh, over the coming weeks and months as we start to peel apart a lot of those details. And there are areas of the domain that are not necessarily over the CONUS, like Alaska or Hawaii, uh, that, we, that we'll also be looking at as well. Okay, so to summarize, my last slide here, uh, RFS is a real major change to the production suite. We're trying to unify a lot in the process. Uh, it's three kilometers, uh, it's an ensemble, it's over a very large domain, rapid updates. At the moment, notionally, we are targeting an implementation for late uh, 2023. And I really wanna underscore that active participation across a vibrant community is very much key to our collective success. So uh, I think we all stand to benefit from getting involved in these kinds of community efforts. And that'll really kind of help us just continue to advance and improve operational NWP for years to come. So the SRW app really underpins the RFS. So if you're interested in improving that operational convection along NWP, it's a great place to get involved and get started. And I will stop there and take questions if there's time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Before great talk about RFS, uh, we do have one question from June. Does the RRFS baseline branch be employed for RRFS prototype test, or it's or a, a private branch? Uh, everything's on GitHub. So all the components should be public. It's, I hope that answers your question. Are you, is, is this especially speaking in terms of uh, like a version of the dynamic core uh, physics and things to check out and that sort of thing? What is RRFS baseline branch? <laughs> Do you not understand? So can anyone uh, explain more about RRFS baseline branch? <laughs> uh, 
I'm wondering if this question is kind of getting at, are you working in the authoritative repository um, or do you have a separate fork a branch that you're using? Potentially that's what this question is regarding. Yeah, Okay. I, I guess, yeah. But I, I, the RF, it's, we have to mention the RFS baseline branch is a branch that we use for a specific UFS RDO project um, looking at physics benchmarking. So it's not specifically related to the RFS development. It's related to uh, some benchmarking that we were running. So that's not a branch you can use to, for example, run the RFS. So um yeah so that would that would need to be done uh in coordination with uh specifically gsl and emc and, and their forks of the of the code okay thanks jeff for explaining that that i I've, sure. I've now connected the dots myself in my head <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i guess the point still stands like are you do you have your own fork that you're working from or is that available to the user community yeah, I, I mean, the code's all on GitHub, right? So everything's public. Um, now, the code and everything that has support for the community is what's associated with the SRW app. Um, so pulling code from forks and stuff that are under development um, by other organizations, I mean, it can be done, but I would say buyer beware. Um, they may be at a variety of in between states that you know may or may not work for you and are not necessarily officially supported so um now that doesn't necessarily preclude anybody giving it a try especially as you get more familiar uh with the system as it evolves but um and of course you can always reach out as well um to see what the latest developments are uh too if you want to you know if there's a new advancement or something that you're interested in trying but um fact of the matter is, is the authoritative repo or the SRW app itself, um, you know, underpins all the other developments as well. So if you work out of that, then you should be in a very good, uh, have a very good foundation uh, to, to, to work on, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think there is a question from Bill. Bill actually on the ensemble prototype on some uh, forecast ensemble. How were the physics physics suites choosing for each model member? Best forecast by model member. You you slide thirteen actually. Ah okay um okay yeah so how do we design the physics suite? So um this was our first attempt okay, okay. At, at running an ensemble. Uh, the RFS ensemble, and then what we decided. So, if uh, let me let me share this back up again real quick, if we got just a minute or two, um, so that folks can have a, a look at this. Um, okay, hopefully everybody's looking at what I think they're looking at now. <laughs> okay, so um, you'll notice a couple things here. So, uh, one uh, is that one of the suites is basically similar to or identical with the operational configuration for the, what we're kind of calling it the control configuration. So the Thompson microphysics and YNN boundary layer. Um, so that one's a, a kind of an obvious one to pick. Uh, the next one is based on GFS physics, but it also mimics the physics that are in the high res window FP3. So it's one that's been run in operation. So we have a fair degree of familiarity with it. The third one down there with NSSL double moment scheme was something we're actually very excited to try. And the reason, one of the motivating factors that we picked that is that it's a scheme that's been uh, tested and run uh, quite a lot uh, in, in the Warren on forecast system. And they've had very good results with it. And uh, we wanted to take that as an opportunity to also try and run it and get some statistics uh, in, the, in the spring forecast experiment and the flash flood experiment using um, that double moment scheme. And so that's what underpinned uh, those choices. Uh, hopefully that uh, explains things. And we're still digging through statistics, so we don't necessarily have concrete outcomes yet that we can kind of um, uh, share in a statistical sense. Thanks, uh, Jacob. Sure thing.
Also, nice to hear from you, Bill. Yeah, they still exist. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there are more questions actually from Slack. Actually, there's two okay. questions. One is from Rob Waters. Where are the improvements to performance on AWS expected? They seem significant. Okay, I don't want to steal too much of Christina's thunder on this question. I'll just say this much. Um, in some sense, it's not unexpected. The cloud, one of the awesome things with the cloud is that there is new hardware um, that becomes available on the cloud much earlier than what you would normally see on you know, working with an on-prem type uh, system. So in, in a conventional sense, we have to every two to five years, maybe there's a refresh uh, in your supercomputing environment that you have access to, okay? So there's a long time period where you have the same interconnect and the same cores and the same nodes and all that. Um, which is fine. Uh, in the cloud, though, you can use new cores, new interconnect whenever they're added into any of the cloud providers data centers. So that also gives us an opportunity to use the latest chips and the latest interconnects. So long as they're available to us, we can move our codes over there and run. Um, and so in that context, it's not necessary. It wasn't a huge surprise. I think it, I think, um, Historically, it's a, it's a, maybe a bit of a big surprise. Ten years ago, you know, this wasn't necessarily an expected. Uh, you know, we weren't necessarily seeing uh, this kind of performance for high performance computing applications in the cloud. But now it's, um, I, I would say, it's pretty normal uh, to see something like that. So, okay, there is there's also a question from Jack on the AWS. I think Mike and Christina will answer that. Yep. In detail, so I will skip that. But there is another question on Slack for you. In the DA system, the number of uh, simulated IASI observations increased more than 50%. Is it just for increasing domain size or number of band or channel also increased or any other factors included? So yeah, you said the large North American 13, uh, North American domain actually has much more data. So just because of domain. Yeah, I think it's strictly the impact of the domain. We didn't change any of the fixed files or configurations between CONUS and North America for that particular test. Um, I don't have them on hand, uh, but there, you know, we can you can look at basically the uh, 2D uh, distribution of observations, and it's very clear uh, that there's a lot more a lot more satellite-based observations going into RFS just owing to simply because of the larger domain. Okay, thank you. So I think we basically ran out of our time and we have two interesting talks coming after the break. Our break is scheduled in 15, 15 minutes break. So we'll come back at 10, 15 mountain time. So 12 minutes. I actually thank have you. one request before everybody leaves. If you don't okay. mind, I'd love to get a picture. So if everybody could turn their, their cameras on and we can do a quick gallery view and get a picture of anybody that's on, I would really appreciate that. And then we'll let you go to break. <laughs> hey, Jacob, uh, just since you're here, um, I hope you'll join us for the open discussion in a bit because it seems like sure. there's several questions related to your talk that are still filing in. Happily, and I can always also tackle them on Slack too. All right. Okay, I'm just gonna give you all another minute here to get your cameras on. Whoops, and I need to learn how to do screenshots. All right. <laughs> I'm going to take a few because there's several pages. So give me a minute here. But first page, one, two, three. OK. Second page, one, two, three. And let me go to the third page. There might not be anybody with their cameras on on that page. So I won't give you a countdown. But I appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much for letting me get a quick picture. 
And we'll, like Ming said, we'll take um, just over a 10 minute break here, try and be back about 10 15. So thanks so much. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, it's 1016 and looks like most people are, are signed in still. Um, the next talk that we have is uh, gonna be from Christina Holt and uh, she's gonna be talking about running the her experiences with running the short range weather app on cloud computing platforms. So Christina, go ahead. Thanks Mike. Um, like you mentioned, I will kind of jump off uh, from where Jacob started talking about our experiences running uh, Rufus on the cloud. Um, I do want to point out that this is um, the experience of a, a larger team, both at NOAA GSL and specifically Ceres, as well as um, a team of engineers over at NOAA EMC. And I should also mention that uh, Jacob was kind enough to share some of his slides from other talks with me here. And so a few of them uh, will seem quite familiar and I appreciate that input from Jacob. So um, I just wanted to start with an outline of what I'll be talking about today. I will provide a quick overview of Rufus and this should um, come as no surprise. It is very similar to what Jacob just introduced us to um, I'll go into a little bit more depth about why we wanted to use the cloud and what cloud architecture we chose for this project. I'll talk a little bit about the things that were needed in addition to the current short range weather application in terms of porting to an unsupported machine, as well as some modifications needed to support our Rufus configuration. And I'll leave you with some lessons learned. Uh, this slide should seem very familiar. Uh, the rapid refresh forecast system is based on the FE3 LAM um, or limited area model. Uh, in its full entirety, it is expected that it will be rapidly updated with data simulation hourly. It runs on a convection allowing grid, so that means about three kilometers and has 65 vertical layers. It does have hybrid ensemble variation all data assimilation, and we expect that that would be a 36 member ensemble helping with that um, data assimilation process. And then nine members of the ensemble uh, would be extended out to, um, to provide forecast guidance. As Jacob mentioned, we will be employing stochastic and multi-physics options to uh, give us uh, the spread that we might expect uh, in an ensemble forecast. And um, it's expected that this uh, forecast is going to run out to 18 hours each hour of the day. But then every six hours on the synoptic times, we would run maybe out to 60 hours to give a little bit longer term guidance. One thing that is important to remember about this is that it does cover a very large North American domain at that three kilometer uh, resolution. So um, that is so that we can really um, gather a bunch of other um, areas of interest that were covered by some of the other some of the other models that Rufus will be replacing. So um, this is a large North American domain. Jacob mentioned briefly that we have some issues with computing needs for Rufus development, and I'll go a little bit more into detail here. Um, so it is designed um, as a system to be run in operations on a super computing system at NOAA called WFOS2. And that is a pretty large uh, on-premises or on-prem machine. And the graphic to the right shows some high water marks for various systems running on that machine in research mode. So each of these different colors is really showing over time how much uh, resources each system is covering. So we have things like the GFS, 
um, Brennan here, RTMA, NAM, um, a variety of different options. I do want to draw your attention to this theoretical max capacity for the machine. And um, all of this in orange here above that max capacity is um, Rufus running in uh, real time on top of all of these other machines. So note that we are far beyond the capability of that machine or the capacity of that machine to be able to run alongside these other systems. So it's going to be really difficult to get all of the runs in that we need to do for research and development um, for this slated implementation in late 2023. So um, we were hoping with this project, the prototyping of Rufus on the cloud, that we can fill that gap and um, have an on-time delivery of a well-tested system. So I wanted to go into a little bit more about what cloud computing is, just because to me, it's often been used as this nebulous term and um, you know, having a better grasp of the concept before we get into um, why we're running there is always a, a good idea. So um, AWS actually defines cloud computing as an on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet, and it runs on a pay-as-you-go pricing model. So instead of buying or owning or maintaining even your physical data center and the servers associated with it, you can access technology services um, like computing power, storage, and databases on an as-needed basis. You don't have to buy the whole thing just to have it and use it for a couple of runs. It's been around for well over a decade. And even though we may not realize it, we use it every day. So Google Suite, um, as your email and calendar service perhaps, app stores, streaming services, and big data firms all take advantage of cloud resources and, and we're not even aware of those things most of the time. However, it wasn't until about 2015 that um, the cloud really started becoming suitable for numerical weather, pre numerical weather prediction, HPC applications. NWP is a large distributed memory task and requires really fast interconnects for efficient IO. And um, back in 2010, without that fast interconnect, um, studies were showing that cloud computing was up to 20 times slower than the HPC systems at that time. So we really have this fast interconnect to thank for this um, for this updated um, performance that we're seeing today. In that um, 2015 to 2019 range, we were seeing several studies that were starting to get into um, the feasibility of uh, numerical weather prediction on the cloud, we were seeing that it was becoming feasible and that um, it was scalable over a variety of um, instances and um, in the computational aspects really were becoming within reach. And then even in 2019, we were starting to get guidance on how we could even optimize that cost instead of whether it's feasible or not. So we're really starting to get in the rhythm of how we can use the cloud for HPC. I wanted to iterate on a couple of other reasons why we want to use the cloud specifically. Um, it does provide a somewhat infinite expansion of a finite computing resource that we're currently existing, uh, we're currently experiencing. Uh, I put infinite in quotes here. It is not an infinite resource, um, but it is quite a bit larger than what we currently have on premises. And we do expect at this point that it's going to perform similarly to those on prem machines. As Jacob mentioned, we had run a couple of um, benchmark tests of the forecast um, component and seeing that those are um, at least comparable. And um, with all of that kind of coming together, we did have a need to deliver some on-time products in real-time experiments. In general, the cloud is going to allow for a speedier development cycle for the next generation of convection allowing forecast guidance. Um, in this study, uh, so far, we've been able to prototype an ensemble 
um, eventually we'll even get to uh, the data simulation system and its rapid update cycle to provide guidance in real time um, where many forecasters can evaluate the results. One other thing that um, we didn't get into too much in the previous talk was that um, this experience can really pave the way for future cloud-based HPC with these UFS applications. One big question that this aims to answer is how much does it really cost? Everybody has um, an idea of what it could be, but just getting in and running it um, can help. So um, we also were interested in whether or not for NOAA, it's feasible to have users set up their own resources. And in general, we're also increasing NOAA's collective experience with cloud resources by um, engaging in this sort of activity. And as Jacob mentioned, um, we wanted to use the cloud because we wanted to provide ensemble guidance that we could not otherwise have provided in real time during the NOAA testbed experiments. This was just too big a computational expense to, to run on any of our on-prem machines. So we did engage with um, the hazardous weather testbed spring forecast experiment in May and June of 2021, and then the hydro meteorology testbed flash flood and intense rainfall experiment in June and July of 2021. Um, so during those two experiments, we were running a forecast ensemble prototype. And that prototype was uh, on a domain that was a three kilometer North America um, coverage. And um, that was nearly 600 million grid points for each ensemble member. There were nine members and we kind of broke it down into three sets of members. Like Jacob mentioned, we have um, different initial and lateral boundary conditions for each of these three sets, as well as a different stochastic perturbation method. And then within each of those, um, we're choosing three different physics options for each of three ensemble members. And then we're doing that for different initial and lateral boundary conditions and stochastic perturbations. So members one through three uh, use the GFS 18Z six hour forecast as initial and boundary conditions. We didn't perturb this set of numbers at all. And then we chose one of each of the physics choices to uh, modify for each of these members. So we kind of have a baseline sub ensemble. For the second set of three members, we did something similar, except this time we switched out the initial and boundary conditions for the global ensemble forecast system member one. We perturbed it with SPPT and then used the same three physics choices for three members there. Similarly, for this third set of three members, we're using the GEFS member two input, perturbing with SPPT, SHUM, and SKEB, just throwing the whole kitchen sink of perturbations at each of these members. And then um, again, each three members will vary by physics choice. All nine members were run out to 60 hours and we chose only to run um, the ensemble once daily at zero Z. And then we delivered those products to the NOAA Big Data Program S3 bucket that's fully available for anybody to go and grab this data for free. So feel free, I'll have links uh, in a couple of slides that point you to that, um, that data set. So we had some real time requirements for this Rufus ensemble. And uh, I just wanted to mention what they are before we get into uh, too much architecture for our cloud resource. The forecast needed to complete in approximately four hours for an on time product delivery. We needed to make sure that our um, resources were spun up reliably each day. And um, since that included 80 C5N instances per member forecast, uh, we chose to choose an architecture that really allowed us to spread those members over different AWS regions and even availability zones to help the chances that we would get the 
the on-demand instances that we need. The cloud architecture, I should mention, was designed in conjunction with our team, Parallel Works and AWS advisors, so that we could achieve that reliability and redundancy. And then, like I mentioned, we were running in real time through two NOAA testbed experiments. So um, this is kind of a broad overview of our cloud architecture that we were using to run the real-time ensemble. This is, seems complicated on the back end, and it can be for sure, but know that um, when you're interacting with these cloud resources, it's very much like interacting with an on-prem machine. You're sitting at your computer using a terminal to SSH to a machine that's out there somewhere, and then you kind of, it starts to feel a little normal. Um, I will mention that we have um, a primary cluster here that was kind of up and running the entire time that we had um, had real-time runs going. So this is a pretty cheap um, single C5N instance here, and it's linked to a compute cluster that could be doing some pretty hefty compute, but not necessarily doing any at the time. Um, we were using this to do things that required the entire ensemble to come together. It has a Lustre file system attached, and that um, file system can uh, talk directly to um, S3 buckets that we have for the project or for um, the big data program S3 bucket. Another job of this primary cluster each day was to spin up nine um, compute clusters, one for each member of the ensemble that we were running. And again, uh, each of those has a pretty, um, a pretty low cost C5N host node, and it's hooked to a parallel cluster instance that has a variety of different types of instances that it can um, submit jobs to. So here we chose to have three different types of instances, a memory bound um, or uh, a large memory set of instances, the R5, so that we could run our memory bound tasks on a few of those. We have a lot of C5N 18x large instances enabled with elastic fabric adapter for that fast interconnect that we need. And then um, a few instances of C5N 2x large that are much cheaper and are used primarily for data transfer um, back and forth between buckets. Each of these member clusters has a Lustre file system that only that cluster has access to. So um, we need that Lustre file system for performance and um, holding our large amount of data that's coming out of the, the forecast model and the post-processing. But then that data has to go to an S3 bucket to be accessible by the outside world or any other member cluster. So each of these, um, each of these member clusters is running a single member on its cluster file system, delivering products to an S3 bucket and then anytime we need the whole ensemble to come together, we're moving that back to the Lustre file system on the primary cluster. And we do this kind of thing for um, creating graphics and doing verification in the end. I want to get a little bit more into uh, what it is going on with each of those member clusters um, and how it ties to running a particular forecast. So in this way, we're treating each member as an independent um, deterministic forecast, and it doesn't rely on any of the other members. So each day, the primary cluster is going to spin up a cluster that looks like this, and a really cool thing kind of happens um, right off the bat with that. As this cluster spins up, it transfers all of the contents of our S3 bucket, including the executable scripts and experiment directory that we created uh, beforehand uh, through the configuration layer of the app. And so it takes all of those and transfers them to our Lustre file system. 
So as soon as this spins up, you already have executables, you have your Rakodo XML. All you need to do is add your cron job to the cron tab um, on spin up, and then it just starts going, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, so that cron job is running here on the host node. It's uh, engaging Rakodo, and that means that it's going to be submitting um, slurm jobs for each of these different uh, short range weather app tasks. So here, like any other um, run that we're doing, we would need to get our external initial and lateral boundary conditions. And so we're going to engage one of those cheaper instances for data transfer as we go out and grab um, the GFS and GEFS files and pull them into our Lustre file system. We then are able to run our make initial conditions and make lateral boundary conditions tasks that are running change res. And that's um, historically been a pretty memory intensive program. So we're using our memory bound R5 high memory instances to run those. Um, we would typically use something like four instances on Hera um, to be able to get enough memory to run this. But here we can use one of these instances and have similar um, timing. So that's great using fewer, fewer resources here. Um, after those are completed, we can run our forecast and we are using inline post here. So we don't have to run UPP separately. Those are um, all running on AD, C5N, 18X large um, compute bound type um, instances. And then they're um, running that inline post. So we're getting grip files out of the forecast product as it runs. And then we have a small job again using data transfer nodes to deliver that output, um, post process it a little bit, um, make smaller domains, for example, with WGRIP2, and then push that out to the NOAA BDP bucket. So all of this is running. Um, and then it's all shut down when this whole thing has completed. So you no longer have access to this Lustre file system. You need to make sure that when you're running before it shuts down automatically that everything has been transferred. And that's how we were running in real time. If you wanted to run this, for example, um, on your own and you didn't have these real time requirements, this would be sufficient to run your entire ensemble um, given that you don't have the requirements of on-time delivery and all of that fun stuff. You could run an entire ensemble on um, just one of these host nodes. So you don't have to do that spin up and, and tear down thing every day if that's not something that is a requirement for your particular needs. So I think it's pretty cool that this is flexible. Um, I could also mention that you could have a host node that had access to many more uh, C5N instances. Maybe you want to break it down into three of these host nodes instead of a full nine and um, handle, for instance, all of your GFS member on um, ensemble members on this same node. And then you would just spin up three a day. So there are lots of ways that this could break down and help. But for each member, this is what we were doing. So the short range weather app uh, offered us a great way um, from the develop branch to get going and port this whole thing to the cloud. Um, we were leveraging the parallel works platform provided by GDIT. So this is um, this is kind of a project that was spinning up along um, in parallel to our project. And um, those folks have a, a goal of creating uh, an AWS resource along with um, similar resources for the other uh, few uh, big three cloud providers. And the idea of that is when you sign on to one of those systems, you have a system that looks very similar to the NOAA RDH PCS platforms like Hera, for example. And that was really nice in that it went ahead and provided um, things like LMOD, Intel compilers, and MPI for us. So we didn't have to install any of that. We did need a couple of 
um, short range weather app specific um, software pieces installed there. And so we had to go through the Rakodo, Miniconda, and Incept Loads uh, installations on that platform. We also had to work with um, the permissions that were granted to that main um, primary cluster so that it would be able to spin up the, the member clusters in an automated fashion. And um, then we did work creating the most cost effective partitions that we could inside the P cluster. Um, so as I mentioned, we started from the develop branch of the short range weather app and um, the, the release branch already had a generic Linux target for running individual members. So we did need to do some development work to expand that to work with the Rakodo, um, the Rakodo workflow manager on a non NOAA supported platform, which wasn't um, too much work, but it did require getting in there and figuring out exactly how, um, how that needed to work on AWS. And then um, we, because we weren't sure uh, how we might submit each of these ensemble members to a member cluster, if at all um, we wanted to do that, we did add some configuration management in our branch for um, running either a full nine member ensemble, a subset of that, so maybe three at a time, or just a single member as a deterministic forecast for each P cluster. We needed to add a few new capabilities to the short range weather app to get exactly the ensemble that we were trying to design. And that meant uh, configuring for um, multiple physics suites for each, well, um, each member having a, a different physics suite. Um, we wanted to use GEFS external uh, model input for the initial conditions and lateral boundary conditions. At the time that we were doing this work, inline post was not available in the short range weather app, but um, it is currently in the develop branch. So that was kind of parallel work that we were doing there. And we were also running with a physics package that's not yet in the develop branch even. So we did need to go through and add um, the necessary files and, and linking that that physics package needed. And of course, pushing and pulling to and from S3 buckets was something that we needed to add as well for our purposes. And um, this was a really cool experience. Um, I hadn't run uh, an NWP system on the cloud at that point, and um, I thought it was a really fun activity, but it also um, proved to be a viable alternative to the on-prem resources that we have. Um, given that we had a nice flexible cloud architecture and a flexible short range weather app, it allowed us to explore many possibilities in balancing cost and performance. And I wanna pass those along to you. Um, so we really were exploring different instance types. Um, in your projects, you might ask, is running slower on cheaper instances possible? Um, you do want to make sure that that's scaling appropriately. If it's taking just as much money to run slower, you might as well get a bigger instance type. Um, so then we also have a fast interconnect that's at play here. Do you really need that speedy delivery? Um, you may even be using a smaller disk if you don't need to do the EFA. Um, you want to take into account ingress and egress. Um, as it does cost to move data to and from the cloud and between different availability zones if, if that becomes an issue for you. And then um, do you even need that reliability across availability zones? So maybe you can just set up a single P cluster for all members and it's fine to wait for the availability of all the members that you need or all the instances that you need. So, um, if you do that, it could reduce your cost and, for instance, the Lustre file system overhead. Um, you may not need to be moving data around as much, and it could reduce the spin-up time for your primary cluster uh, that's running 
your ensemble members. I felt really bad about going through all of these uh, all of these slides and not giving you at least a little bit of weather ag candy. So I just wanted to mention that um, we did deliver processed output grids and images like the ones you see here um, from the real-time runs to the NOAA Big Data Program S3 bucket. So you can go and look at some of the forecasts that we were producing for each of these members there. Um, I put links here to the registry that describes um, a little bit more in detail uh, what the data is and then also a link to the bucket itself so that you can even click in your browser to see images like these. So um, we do recommend that you go and check it out if you're looking for a, a decently robust data set for different physics options. Um, this is available for you to use. So I'm going to leave you there with a few of the references that I glossed over early on here, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Uh, I think we can take time for one quick question from the chat um, from Jack Settlemeyer. Um, was that uh, GDIT HPC like setup expensive to procure, um, something like a ballpark cost? Um, I can't actually answer that whole question. Um, this is wrapped up as part of um, a larger procurement at NOAA. Um, I think if Jacob is here, he may be able to answer that a little more clearly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Christina is 100% right. Um, the project itself uh, is sort of a kind of a, I don't know, sort of a sub thing of a larger uh, grant portfolio. Um, and GDIT is the contract through which we're able to access not just AWS, but also Google Cloud Platform and uh, Azure. And then that access is facilitated through a very nice web interface um, via Parallel Works. I'm not sure if that completely answers the question, um, I mean, we could follow up in Slack, of course. All right, thanks. Um, I think we need to uh, move on to the next talk. Um, again, we will have a 30 minute open discussion um, after Lucas is done. Uh, so any additional questions, please put them in Slack and we'll, we'll get to them during that period. Okay, and uh, next up is and our final talk for the week, uh, which is Lucas Harris. Um, we'll be talking about GFDL development. Oh, th thank you, Mike. Uh, so uh, thanks everybody for uh, yeah sitting still for uh, yeah for my talk at the end of a very long week. I know everybody's uh, yeah people are probably pretty well worn out. I know it's been a lot of work this week for a lot of you, but thank you for uh, thank you for holding on. Okay, can everybody see my screen? We can, okay. thank you. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. Uh, before I get started, I wanna certainly uh, thank everybody who contributed to this, both, uh, both at GFDL and our partners uh, around, the, uh, around the UFS and FE3 communities as well. So, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what sort of development we've been doing here on, at GFDL. I'm gonna focus on uh, weather timescale development, although I will briefly mention our, uh, our uh, climate work, which is what our laboratory is principally known for. So this is the GFDL Unified Modeling Suite. So GFDL it, uh, has been for many decades the center of many for, for that it develops many different kinds of modeling systems. And over the last couple of decades, uh, we've taken a number of different modeling systems that are used for a lot of different purposes and been able to unify them into one suite that uses a single framework and is unified around a single dynamical core as well. So basically everything that we do from minutes to millennia uses a very similar framework. The big difference is that we're using different physics on different time scales. And uh, also the longer time scale models are coupled to a dynamic ocean, the MOM6 ocean and the LM4 uh, land model, both of which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, but this right here just shows the true power of the FE3 dynamical core that it can do all these sorts of things that it is configurable enough for all, all these different purposes. And I'll give you a flavor of some of the applications that we can do with it, uh, that we do with it here at GFDL. Uh, certainly, I don't want to say we're the only ones doing this. Of course, a lot of the a lot of what we did here formed the foundation of the UFS to begin with. Um, so, 
you know, if the UFS falls on a lot of different ideas that are taken from many different places. And of course, our partners at, uh, play at uh, in NASA, at NCAR, and at a number of different centers worldwide, they're using FE3 for a number of different purposes. In fact, I just saw a nice article from today about using FE3-based uh, geoschem chemistry transport module, uh, which is a pretty cool application there. Um, so uh, we have two routes, or a couple of different routes to high resolution modeling within FE3. And by high resolution, I'm referring to convective scales. And you can run a global cloud resolving model uh, that uses, or excuse me, global storm resolving model that runs at global three kilometer resolution. This is something you can do, but it's too expensive right now for general purposes. But we do have two other routes you can do, use, you can use that are implemented within FE3. And one is to use the global to regional approaches that have been built within FE3. We have two ways of doing zooming or variable resolution global modeling within FE3. And one is the approach that we actually show here on the, on the left is this uh, very simple way in which you take the cube sphere and deform it into a pyramid using an analytical transformation. This is a transformation that only takes about a second to construct, uh, but it does give you a very, very easy and a very efficient way to reach very high resolutions over part of the globe. And it gives you a lot of benefit. And uh, the other method is uh, two-way nesting, something I'll talk about more about in this talk as well. Um, and there's a lot that you can do with these things. It's a very powerful set of techniques. You get consistent rapid interaction between your global and your regional domains. Your boundary conditions are considerably improved by doing this sort of two-way interactions. Uh, and furthermore, you have this very tight, consistent interaction between the larger scales and your smaller convective scales, which is great for things like tropical cyclones that very strongly modify their environment. And this also opens the door towards uh, extending convective scale prediction beyond the current 18 hour horizon out to 96, 120, uh, out to 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. Uh, we've done experiments out to 45 days and even longer with uh, these sorts of models. Uh, and I really think that this sort of variable resolution approach, this is the future of convective scale modeling. This is where we want to go in the future. And this is something that we can do now. And in fact, we are doing this in real time at here at GFDL and our partners uh, elsewhere in the community. The other method is to use the uh, limited area model, the stand, uh, that's formerly called the standalone regional domain, and that's the, the approach that's used in the short range weather application. And this has a lot of powerful attributes to it as well. One of the biggest things is that it's simple, it's easy, and it's very inexpensive. You can run a, lar you can run a relatively large domain over the area you're interested in. If you're just interested in doing short range forecasts, this is the perfect solution for everybody. Indeed, that's what the SRW application was designed to do. Um, and one of the big things is that you, you can focus on just the area you're interested in. Global modeling is hard because you have to get everything in the world right. Um, and furthermore, I really think, oh, another thing that I've really been encouraging to people is that three kilometers is not the end for these regional domains. And you take a look what our partners at the UKMO are doing, they're running 100 meter domains over London operationally. Um, and there's other centers that are looking at running sub-kilometer domains as well. And I think that is the future of the regional, the limited area domain modeling. And there's a lot that can be done with this. There's, uh, we can do uh, operational large eddy simulation, coastal simulation, urban scale simulation, worn on forecast. There's a ton of possibility in the future for the limited area domain when you push into higher resolutions. So I think, um, so, uh, this is actually a convenient platform for me to push this idea because there's a lot of really great people on this call. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, younger people I know on this call. There's an effort to push towards graduate students. And I really think these are ideas that you might want to think about, uh, you might want to think about as you develop your careers. I think there's a really a big future ahead of regional modeling as it pushes into the sub-kilometer domain. So now I'm going to focus on a GFDL Shield, which is one of our uh, configurations here at GFDL. Uh, SHIELD stands for the System for High Resolution Prediction on Earth to Local Domains. Uh, this is an atmosphere model that couples FV3 to the modified GFS physics. And it got its start as basically a, a way of evaluating FV3 in a GFS-like environment that is built during the NGGPS evaluation process. And that's our flagship SHIELD model here. It's a GFS-like model. In fact, the current GFS got its, uh, the FV3-based GFS got its start as an early version of, of SHIELD, in fact. Uh, we can go beyond that. We can course into lower resolutions. So we can run a, uh, longer out to sub-seasonal to seasonal time scales, or we can use the variable resolution capabilities, put a nest over the continental United States or over the North Atlantic. So we can forecast severe storms or hurricanes or uh, also mountain meteorology, something else I'm getting excited about. 
We have a global cloud resolving model, XShield, what we've been uh, actually developing for quite a long time. We've got some nice papers that have been published uh, with our community partners on that. And we can also configure uh, Shield as a regional configuration too, what we call our Shield. Um, so if you're interested in more learning more, you can go to this website right here. We also have our real-time forecast that we run uh, on, uh, on our real-time website that you can check out. Uh, so uh, I want to start by talking a little bit about the development of uh, Shield over the years. I mentioned that it got its start back in uh, 2016 as a uh, uh, as uh, just taking the GFS physics unmodified and coupling it to FV3. Um, and the shock to a lot of people was that we actually were getting results that are almost as good as the existing legacy GFS at the time. We are, our large scale skill was almost as good as the existing GFS. And this actually shocked the people from uh, the UK who were uh, part of, who were on this committee that was evaluating it, is that the experience of like the UKMO, when they changed the dynamical core, it takes years to get a good forecast skill out of the model. And indeed we were able to do this in six months. But then we went from there, we started tuning the we started tuning the physics. We started introducing new physical parameterizations. We introduced uh, uh, our GFDL microphysics, which we've tuned and refined over the years. Uh, we've taken new uh, advances from our partners, especially at EMC, where we've introduced new turbulence schemes, uh, and made a number of different advances to the point where over the years we've been able to gradually improve our uh, the precipitation skill both within the tropics and in the continental United States over and over again, and. Now, each incremental improvement doesn't look like a whole lot. And certainly one of the complaints is that, well, there's a new version of the GFS. How come it hasn't beaten the euro at absolutely everything yet? And well, the, thing, the, the nice thing here is that when we keep iterating, all of those keep, keep adding up. And this is actually a quote that I heard this week from uh, a John, John Gruber, a tech, uh, tech blogger, saying that incremental improvements like this, they're like compound interest. So you keep doing it, keep doing it. They just keep adding up. And that's one of the big philosophies behind the UFS is that we can keep introducing a lot of new stuff into it, as well as having a good vision for how the operational systems can be. And over time, things can be really great. And I'm actually gonna show some of the examples of what this has meant for operational modeling systems in the next few slides. Um, so first I want to, uh, one more slide to tootle my own horn a bit about shield development. Uh, we, uh, we introduced new versions of uh, shield. We upgrade about every year. I've been trying to encourage slowing down the uh, cadence a bit so we can focus on some other things. Uh, but uh, I, I got a lot of great people I'm working with and there's always new innovations that are coming out. Uh, here's a 2021 version of shield that uses the new versions of FE3 as well as uh, new GFDL microphysics uh, integrated in line with everything else. Uh, as well as uh, the new uh, really fan really cool uh, uh, turbulence scheme that's now using the GFS, the T turbulent kinetic energy scheme. And by that and further improving the cloud radiation interactions, we find that we can reduce the errors and bias in the 500 millibar ACC by a pretty good chunk here. So I have to say this one here on the, on the, on the right, I apologize, is Shield 2021. Um, and one thing we find is that by improving the cloud radiative interactions has been one of the big things with driving improved large scale skill. And that's not just kind of an abstract thing, not just an abstract headline measure. Uh, we find that this can have big impacts, even on relatively short time scales. We find that it actually has had a big impact in, in a sea shield or continental US configuration. It's helped us improve medium range forecasts in severe weather. Uh, and going even beyond that, we can take a look at improving the cloud radiation interactions in T-Shield, our, our hurricane model. And we find that that has greatly improved track predictions as well. Um, here's another project we're involved in. That's a uh, collaboration with the European Center, in which uh, we've gotten initial conditions from the European Centers. And really, one of the one of the, the biggest thing about the European Center is twofold. One is that they have great rubber ducks, which is the true reason for their success, right? Uh, the other thing is uh, that they produce the greatest that their analyses or data simulation cycling is top notch. On the European Center model itself, there's nothing special about it. And in fact, it's actually more primitive at this point than the than the GFS is. Uh, but it's very well put together and very well integration integrated with the data simulation cycling. Uh, so uh, we've taken our, our initial conditions, we run that for a year, and we give the results back to the European Center. A number of different centers worldwide have contributed this as well. Uh, we're the only ones from the US who have done this. Uh, but the big result here is that the best tropical cyclone tracks in this time period was indeed the European Center. The second best was SHIELD. And indeed, we we're actually caught in, catching up to the European Center at day six and seven uh, with uh, ICON pretty close behind, which is the, the German model. Uh, 
So one of the things I really like to ha hammer on is that one of the best things to really improve your model is improving the data simulation, but that's probably the hardest thing about improving your model too. It is such a difficult subject. Uh, now I'm gonna discuss both NOAA experimental and operational models. And for hurricane tracks a season. So I live here in New Jersey. We just got hammered by Ida. And before that we got hit by Henry. And then we had more floods last night. That's a tropical system though. Um, and the big question is how do tracks look like from these different systems? So I show a couple, of, we show the op, uh, operational GFS, operational HWARF, as well as uh, SHIELD, and then two, uh, two experimental nested models, one run by AOML, a uh, HAS prototype, and T-SHIELD that we run. And this is track air in the Atlanta because this is the only area that those models cover. But uh, we can see that the track errors for a lot of these models is pretty good. I mean, a historical basis, 175, nautical miles, and honestly, I couldn't tell you what a nautical mile is, but uh, these are pretty small errors at day five on a historical basis. And to top it off, the GFS has been doing a fantastic job this year, something I'll quantify in the next slide. HWARF and, uh, HWARF and the regional models, they do a little, little, little bit behind. Uh, one thing that I actually thought was pretty cool is that uh, the global, our global shield model is actually doing a little bit better than the GFS. Not to say that the GFS is doing badly because the GFS is actually doing a fantastic job. And I don't make that lightly. Uh, here are plots of hurricane track error of the GFS of SHIELD and of the European Center. And there's been a lot of hand wringing about the years about how much better the European Center is at forecasting hurricanes. And hurricane track, they mean by that. The best hurricane intensity prediction model in the world is HWARF, something that NOAA's had. NOAA's had the best intensity prediction models in the world for decades now. HWARF and then before that GFDL hurricane model. But in the 2020 season, you can see that not only are that pretty much all four of these models, uh, the, the GFS, the Euro and our two uh, GFDL models, they were pretty much on top of each other. Uh, and a very small difference between the models on a, on a historical basis. So the GFS has effectively caught up with the Euro. And I've seen this also in some of the other models, the HWARF is also doing a fantastic job. And then you can take a look at this season uh, so far, going up until uh, very re until about the last week, just after Hurricane Larry. The GFS did a phenomenal job on Hurricane Larry, and it also did an excellent job on Ida uh, and a lot of other tropical cyclones this year. And indeed, the 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 GFS is actually not only meeting the European Center at some time ranges, it is beating the European Center. And this is actually a monumental achievement. And I honestly think it needs to be getting some more press. Uh, the other thing I can point out is that the, our 13 kilometer shield or real time shield is actually even doing a little bit better than that. Um, so there's actually a pretty nice increment at, uh, at 120 hours, 15% better. So not only, yeah, so it's actually pretty staggering just how far the GFS has come over the last five years. I mean, not that it was bad earlier, it's more, more people most people, mostly buffoons on Twitter trashing it. It was a world-class model before. Now it's a fantastic model. And in fact, the European, the, the, the GFS has gotten so much better. The National Hurricane Center is relying on it almost entirely for its track forecast. I've heard anecdotal evidence that even television meteorologists are starting to rely pretty heavily on the GFS. I mean, these are the people whose faces are being put on, on live television saying that this is the forecast that I'm making. I'm trusting the GFS for this forecast. That's a pretty ringing endorsement in my, my ear. So, uh, a little bit about Hurricane Ida's uh, precipitation. I live here in New Jersey. Uh, Ida may landfall in Louisiana, and yet it's here that we were all sent home for a couple of days due to the severe flooding. Uh, it's actually quite, quite impressive. There, is a pr there are roadways that are well above the water level at the river that flows near my house that were submerged. And so the question is, how predictable is this precipitation? And it turns out that it's actually quite well predictable. Here's our uh, T-shield, a three-kilometer nest. You can see the uh, edge of the nest right here. And uh, the conventional wisdom is that nesting is bad because everything near the nesting boundary is going to be messed up. Uh, and indeed, that is not true. And uh, furthermore, we've actually seen fantastic precipitation forecasts. It was challenging to pick up the extent of the very heaviest precipitation here in the purple, but we are able to pick up a lot of very widespread heavy precipitation well in advance at the right locations in this, uh, in this nested grid model. So I've been talking a lot about hurricanes. Uh, I want to talk a little about severe storms now, and this is actually one of the more exciting applications for me uh, is uh, Sea Shield. 
And this is a continental United States nest. We put a three kilometer nest in a global model. And this, allow, this frees us to start doing convective scale forecasts out to at least five and a half days. We can push this out to even longer time ranges if we want. Um, and we submit this to the spring experiment every year. Uh, I highly encourage anybody who's interested in severe weather to uh, attend the uh, spring experiment next year if you're interested. They, it's a fantastic experience. Uh, uh, so a bunch of different models are submitted to this. Uh, the UKMO has been one of the great performers over the last uh, decade. It's been amazing how much they've been able to do for the United States, uh, an area that they nominally uh, isn't under their responsibility. Uh, there's a couple of different configurations of FE3-based models. Uh, in particular, you can see two here. One is the GFDL uh, Sea Shield. And we designed this with more of an eye towards longer range prediction, not short-term prediction. And so as a result, uh, Sea Shield usually rates very highly for uh, storm placement, as you can see here, uh, stratiform precipitation extent, anvils, uh, and uh, cold pools, the extent of cold pools. And these are all the things that you really need to get right if you want your predictions to be accurate after, say, 36 hours. One of the big challenges for next day severe storm prediction is that after the first day, you have all these different cold pools running around. They may not be in the right place, may not be the right strength, and they're going to cause all sorts of uh, storm. They're going to cause storms to erupt maybe in places that they shouldn't be. Now, on the other, at the other end of the time scale is the fantastic uh, NSSL version here, seen in the lower left. And it's designed to do a great job uh, simulating fine scale, convec fine convective scale feature here and the storm dynamics. And you'd expect a la laboratory called the National Sphere Storms Laboratory to do that. Same way you'd expect a laboratory called the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory to do longer term geophysical fluid dynamics. Um, and yeah, the, the NSSL version is a, fan it's a fantastic short range weather prediction uh, version because it does have all the information that the human forecasters need. It has a lot of beautiful fine scale information and another great thing about the, what NSSL has been able to do is that they have all this beautiful fine scale information, but it's all realistic fine scale information. There's none of this sm small scale meteorological noise that has plagued uh, convective scale models in the past. So this is a really promising future for the SRW app right here. And that NSSL's achievements really uh, lead the way towards what can be done with this. Uh, another example we can do is Sea Shield. So it's not. Uh, and we, be, we keep improving this. We, one of the nice things about being part of a unified suite of weather models is that you can take achievements from other models and implement them within uh, this one model. And so here's one example of what we've been able to do. So uh, there's been some consternation of late that one of the FV3-based limited area models uh, has a case of the zips, to put it one way. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of this very scattery, intense precipitation that's just it's kind of all over the place. It's a lot more intense than what you are, would originally seen. It's in the wrong places. So the question is, why? And so we've actually sat down. So we actually we were running the same case in real time, and we found out that we were not having these problems. That we were actually having pretty good light precipitation represented, as well as some of the more organized stuff. You see some of that convective stuff down in the Carolinas, up in uh, uh, up in uh, up in Canada. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the province lines. I have to apologize for that for anybody from Canada. Up in, uh, and up in uh, uh, Montana. Uh, yeah. Mrs. Ah, my. What's that state up there that looks kind of like a big nose? I forget. The Minnesota, that's right. I, I apologize for anybody from Minnesota about that. I've been, it's been a long week. Um, and we made a lot of improvements to uh, Sea Shield over the years that really do a good job at being able to control this very in inaccurate precipitation that we get in the warm season. So there's really a lot of a lot of innovations coming down the pipeline that can help solve some of these problems that uh, some naive uses might have. Um, and I mentioned medium range forecast severe storms. We want to go beyond severe medium range. We want to go into S2S time ranges, subseasonal time ranges, and. Uh, we actually believe that there is some promise that for predicting severe storm outbreaks on those timescales. So uh, here's an example of what we did. We've degraded sea shield, so there's a five kilometer conus nest and a uh, 16 kilometer global domain. And we run this for, we run 30 day on 11 member ensembles uh, for every, every, uh, every week during the warm, during the spring for a five year period. And we were looking at categorical evaluation about whether there's above average severe storm activity or below average severe storm activity uh, measured by the amount of uh, updraft helicity that we get in the model. And uh, we use a Hideki, uh, Hideki skill score metric for this. And we find that 
nationally that there is some good skill out to at least week three for predicting severe storm outbreaks in the warm season. Uh, and so that's, that itself is, by a, pretty, is a pretty cool result. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, yeah, certainly it's not great, but this is useful information for people who are doing some seasonal forecasting. And you can go beyond that. You can take a look at certain regions that in which severe, so severe storms, if you're in the Southern Plains, you guess that there's going to be severe storms in, in the next month in the, in the spring. You're probably going to be right, right? It's, uh, it's going to be hard to improve upon that persistence forecast. Same story with the southeastern United States. In the upper Midwest and in the Northeast, though, it's not so common to have severe weather outbreaks in the spring. Um, so that having above average or below average activity, that's a useful metric. And indeed, we see in these regions that we do have enhanced predictability out to week four. Um, so this gives you some idea about what sort of utility that these sorts of some seasonal forecasts could have if they were developed further. Oh, one other thing I want to point out is that uh, people may be a little skeptical that at five kilometer resolution can actually simulate rotating thunderstorms. Um, we took a look at this and indeed you are reproducing uh, tracks of updraft helicity of rotating thunderstorms in this model at five kilometer resolution. And, in, and this is actually uh, can be taken further. Our partners at NASA Goddard, they're running a global six and a half kilometer model in real time. You can go to the GMAO website and see it. Um, and they can do skillful severe storms forecasts as well. And part of that may be maybe just due to the fact that FE3 is a very good model representing those rotating updrafts, a very good dynamical core, excuse me. I have to apologize for, yeah, mess, messing up my own rules. Uh, how much time do we have? Um, you have about five minutes left. Um, five minutes. We are moving into the open question session. So if you go a few minutes over, it's fine. Okay. Um, so let's see here. So yeah, unfortunately I don't have time for this but because there's some other stuff I wanted to get to, but. Anyway, I want to talk a bit about, vort uh, I mentioned vorticity dynamics in my talk the other day. Um, and vorticity dynamics is extremely important for a lot of different purposes at all scales. Um, one of the things that was found when FV FV3's predecessor called FV was put, into, uh, was put into the GFDL climate model is that it turned a very good climate model to one of the best in the world with a very low error in ocean heat uptake. And part of that was due to the representation, the, the course representation of the mid-latitude jets, those mid-latitude jets are basically driven by vorticity dynamics. And indeed that in producing FV corrected this problem that had plagued climate models for years. This gave huge, this led to enormous improvements in climate modeling uh, to the point where their ocean variability on longer timescales is now credible. And then you can see the same sort of things at convective scales, both in severe storm updrafts, you can see our very fine scale rotating updrafts, and uh, also uh, vortical hot towers within tropical cyclones that are responsible for land falling, uh, land falling hurricanes, tornadoes, as well as controlling intensity. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about uh, radiative convective equilibrium and idealized uh, studies within uh, FE3. You can run doubly periodic, or you can create, do a global super stretch simulation, which gives you these uh, very nice things that look an awful lot like a interesting charismatic atmospheric phenomenon, do they not? Um, so this is one of the, yeah, so these are cool things. I wish I had some more time to talk about. Um, we can, I also want to talk a bit about SPEAR, which is our uh, coupled climate mo prediction model at GFDL. This is more built like a climate model. Um, and this is used for subseasonal, seasonal, and decadal prediction. And uh, there's been some really cool results coming out of this, uh, both for seasonal prediction. Um, a recent paper has been published in which it was found that atmospheric rivers are predictable up to nine months in advance. Uh, maybe not individual atmospheric river events, but the likelihood of single or multiple events. Uh, and you can also use this, the great Spear Large Ensemble. It's a 50 kilometer ensemble, which doesn't sound like high resolution to us, uh, but it is a very high resolution for a couple of climate models. And it's an excellent tool for assessing climate risk, uh, especially on decadal timescales and under different uh, anthropogenic scenarios. So you can look at atmospheric rivers or drought in this too. Uh, it's been applied for uh, MJO prediction. Uh, we've got some fantastic results. There's this paper that just accepted the bands uh, in which with this ensemble of sphere forecasts is the very inexpensive ensemble that we can run that we get 30 days of useful uh, MJO prediction. Uh, this is longer than any other model ensemble within the United States. Um, and this opens the door to some really cool things that you can apply to this as, as, as in addition to much improved S2S forecasting for a lot of purposes. Um, 
in the in in shield uh we've been doing some mjo forecasting ourselves uh we go to a higher resolution and we use the mixed layer ocean uh it's very in a very simple mixed layer ocean is really all what you need to get a good mjo simulation even at very low resolution and we find that we get 28 days of deterministic useful skill of mjo prediction we can go further we can put a nested grid over the maritime continent in which we're resolving in which we're able to uh explicitly represent convection uh, in this area where the MJO gets stuck. And for those cases that the MJO has the biggest problem, we actually have 39 days of MJO predictability. Um, I briefly do want to mention a couple other things. Uh, there's the GFDL LM4 land model, uh, which has introduced a lot of really cool, very high resolution capabilities. Um, in particular, been, uh, one of the big focuses has been on uh, uh, subgrid heterogeneity in the land surface. Uh, even if you have a three kilometer grid, the land isn't uniform in those three kilometers in most places. This can have big impacts for uh, a lot of different purposes, including say uh, river runoff. Uh, here's a big difference in a 25 kilometer model, but when you introduce this uh, subgrid heterogeneity. Uh, there's been a lot of great work that's being done with MOM6. Uh, MOM6 is of course the community ocean model uh, that relies on a world of developers. Uh, this is a uh, originally developed here at GFDL back in 1980, and it's been continually upgraded since then. Lately, there's been this community effort for a couple for a regional model within MOM6. So it's usually configured as a global model, but it's picking up in the legacy of the Princeton Ocean model to be able to run as a regional model. And finally, I want to discuss the uh, XShield global cloud resolving model. Um, this is a very efficient global storm resolving model, not a global cloud resolving model. Uh, it has excellent fine scale convective scale features. It's very fast. It's much more efficient than any global cloud global storm resolving model on the planet. Um, it's been submitted to a number of different, uh, it's being used by a number of different community partners. There's been a lot of papers that have been written on this already. Um, we're partnering with uh, AI2 Climate Modeling, the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence uh, to use the output from this model to uh, train a much cheaper emulator of moist physics. Uh, this is an excellent project we also have with AI2 and a large community collaboration to port, uh, to port the GFS into a domain-specific language, which basically means rewriting it in Python. And of course, we all know interpreted languages are very slow. How can you make a model faster by writing in Python? Well, if you, took, if you pair it with this package called GT4Py, which basically translate Python into machine language that is optimized for any particular platform, especially things like GPUs that require re recoding your model anyway, you can get one code base that you can then port to any different number of, of, of supercomputers, say CPUs, GPUs, ARMs, FPGAs, quantum computings, abacuses, if you really want to do that, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, you have one code base that can do it all. And this is a really cool thing that could, that is a bit of an experimental thing right now, but we're really excited about where we could go with this in the future. Um, and a number of different oncoming, uh, uh, a number of different coming attractions. Um, I mentioned some of the idealized test case study that we have, um, but we also have things like the new nesting capabilities or we're working with AOML and EMC on moving nested grids in particular. We have upgrades to the solver that are coming down the pike. We're working on a uh, deep atmosphere, uh, deep atmosphere dynamics, whole atmosphere modeling. Uh, we're looking into upgrades to the horizontal solver. There's a new, uh, new ideas taken from, uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics. We want to do more work to better integrate the physics and dynamics. Uh, really moving modeling forward is going to need us to better unify physics and dynamics, not to push them farther apart. And our partners at NASA Goddard, who've actually been using FV3 longer than anybody else, they are doing a ton of great stuff. And one of the big things is this uh, FV3 adjoint, uh, which is uh, a complete model. It's very useful for data simulation and predictability studies. Uh, and finally, I want to uh, uh, give a shout out to the people who have done the very hard work. Um, in particular, I want to acknowledge S.J. Lin, uh, who I had the great privilege of working with until his retirement a couple of years ago. Uh, he is the father of FV3. Uh, he was, uh, uh, yeah, he is, is arguably one of the best model developers in the world and one of the best dynamical core developers in the world. Um, I thought this quote was a very good uh, way of putting, uh, summing up his career. Those who say something cannot be done are often interrupted by those doing it. And I want to acknowledge the uh, excellent uh, FE3 team that I work with, the people who've done uh, a lot of the work that I showed here today. Uh, with that said, that is all. And I would love to take questions. And if there's something else you'd like to see some more of, uh, please do let me know. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lucas. Um, there was a, uh, a question in the chat um, from June Park. 
um, asking uh, if you had any ideas um, why there was better performance for the GFDL 13 kilometer shield versus the three kilometer T shield for hurricane track errors. That's actually a fantastic point. Um, so there's this kind of idea out here that higher resolution means everything should be better. Um, and it's not really true. It takes a lot of work to make a higher resolution domain do better at things. And it depends on what sort of better things you're talking about. Um, and one of the things that we have noticed over the years and reg uh, is that regional models tend to not be, regional models haven't been as good as the global models at hurricane track forecasting for the last 15 years or so. Uh, it used to be that the GFDL hurricane model, regional model was the best track model in the world, but then it's, it's the GFS and then the Euro. Um, the regional models have done a great job catching up over the years, but there's a tendency for these regional models to simply not represent the large scale as well as the global models do. And that could just be simply a limitation, just how they're designed, whether they're, uh, whether there's uh, the variable resolution or the limited area domain simply doesn't allow as good of a uh, evolution of large scale state or what. But yeah, that, that is a fantastic question. Now I should point out that the global models usually are not used for intensity. However, the GFS has done a uh, very good job at forecasting intensity in recent years. Thanks. Um, Thank you. I see uh, Geely has their hand up, so go ahead. Sure, Lucas, uh, I, have a, I have two questions. First question is, uh, is there a convective scale data simulation in the seashell? The second question is, in the comparison of the SARS-3 uh, and the seashell, where mm -hmm. the seashell remove most of these uh, spurious uh, convective cells all over the domain, uh, what do you think that contribute more like which reason contribute more to the difference, either the uh, physics, particular microphysics or uh, dynamics options? Um, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's a combination of both. Um, physics and dynamics need to be developed together. Um, and I'll point to three big things that I think are making the difference. Uh, one is that I suspect that the diffusion is turned up too high in that uh, SAR model. Um, and I've actually been working with some of the folks at uh, EMC. So like uh, Jacob and uh, Eric, I've been, uh, I've been working with them a bit to be able to help tune down the diffusion quite a bit. And in fact, uh, Eric came to me saying that he reduced the diffusion by about, let's see here, from 0 0.075 to 0 0.03. And it made a significant improvement in the stability and in the structure of convective storms within, uh, within their limited area model, their RFS prototype. And I think that uh, with some work, they can reduce it even further. Uh, the other thing is that, um, the other thing is that we've actually found that at three kilometer resolution and turning on the shallow convective parameterization can make a huge difference. And most convective scale models don't use shallow convection uh, because, well, people are told that at three kilometers, you don't need convective scheme. Uh, you can actually argue that you might even need a deep convective scheme at three kilometers because you're not resolving deep convection at three kilometers. You resolve deep convection at 250 meters, and that's true of pretty much any model. But shallow convection, nobody can tell me that you're resolving uh, shallow cumulus at three kilometer resolution. Uh, you can't even represent it at three kilometer resolution. So that is a process that's missing in a lot of convective scale models. Now, one thing that I have heard is that Joe Olson's fantastic uh, EDMF uh, MYNN scheme does have a shallow convection module within it, which I actually think is a, a fantastic idea. And it, it's one of the, it's actually a really, probably the best place for it. Because I mean, ultimately the PBL, yeah, PBL dynamics and shallow convective dynamics are not that different. And then there are efforts at other places, especially at Caltech to unify those. So that, those are the two big things. Um, could you repeat your first question again? I got a little excited there. About the data simulation, there a C show to have any data simulation, combative skill data simulation. Uh, we do not. Um, so we're, we're just take, we're just cold starting from the GFS analyses. Um, uh, it is true that uh, some of the that a lot of these models have been doing some experimental data simulation. The first one was by our partners at uh, by the by the late Fuxing Zhang's group at uh, Penn State University, um, where they actually did some of this work in uh, uh, what was, what is now T Shield. Um, but yeah, we don't we don't do that sort of data simulation here at GFDL. No. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat. Uh, yeah, there's a question in the chat um, asking for CUDA-based FE3. Is it based on CUDA Fortran or CUDA C slash C++? 
That's a fantastic question. So um, the uh, CUDAs that were, uh, I, I believe that the CUDA that uh, NASA Goddard did, and that's about a decade ago, and it hasn't really been maintained. Um, I want to say that was CUDA C, because this was all that was really available back then. Um, I do know that the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, what they're doing, which is a rather significant extension of uh, FV3 to incorporate a lot of different physics packages, that is CUDA C. Um, and uh, they're, they're, doing, they're doing some neat work with that, but it's, yeah, decidedly not backwards compatible. And the big thing is that it takes a lot of work to do this. And going beyond that, it's not portable. I mean, CUDA C won't run on your, will not run on any of, G, of uh, NOAA's current supercomputing systems because they're CPUs, they're not GPUs, except for that little partition they had there on, uh, on Thea. Um, so, we could port the mo we could port the model. We could port the UFS into CUDA C. It'd be pretty much useless for everybody who's using the UFS. Um, and that's indeed part of the reason why we're interested in the domain specific language is that it'd be one code that would be portable to all systems. So thank you very much. It's a fantastic question. Great. And uh, <clears throat> not seeing any uh, more new questions. Um, thanks for your talk, Lucas. Oh, thank you so um, much. And uh, I've, uh, since we have our, our open discussion for the next 20 minutes or so, um, I'll revisit some of the questions that have come through in the chat across, over the course of the morning. Um, the first one was from Chong Chi Tong. Um, it's mentioned, uh, and I think hopefully um, Jacob and uh, Jeff are also here. I think I saw them earlier. Um, and he's asked, it is mentioned uh, that Ensemble forecast capabilities uh, are under development and will be available in the near future for short range weather app. Um, what ensemble model can be read as input, if any, to generate the ensemble ICs? And there was some discussion um, in the Slack, but I figured I'd bring it to the larger group because people may not have uh, seen that answer. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I responded briefly in the, in the uh, Slack discussion. And uh, let let him know that uh, you know we currently are only avail only able to use the external models that are available for the deterministic system for the ensemble mode. Um, goal the goal in the future is to be able to initialize individual members off of individual GEFs members or or you know, GDAS, ENKF. Um, we do have ChangeRest Cube running individually on each ensemble member. With that in mind, uh, it's just a matter of hooking up. Uh, the individual members to each of the guest members, for example. And that's going to require some modification and allowing the user to read in the guest data. Uh, so it's it's a goal in the near future, but uh, can't currently be, be done. I know that was done already for the RFS ensemble work that was done in the cloud, for example. Um, so I know it exists in the forks. It just it doesn't exist in the authoritative repo yet. Jeff said everything I was going to say and said it better. Perfect. Um, Gili, I, I believe your hand is still up from your previous question, but did you uh, have something to add? OK. Um, all right, uh, thanks for those answers. Um, now moving on to, uh, to the next question that I had from earlier. Um, this may have been answered during Christina's talk, but uh, I'll say it anyway. Um, were, were the improvements that were noted um, when moving to the improvements in performance on AWS, were they expected? Because they, they seem quite significant compared to the, uh, on the on-premises machines. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we covered that one. Um, but I mean, I, can, I guess I can say it again. Uh, on the cloud, you know, five, 10 years ago, it would have been a surprise, uh, but in today it, it's not, I think, um, you know, and, and we have access to newer hardware um, as it continually gets refreshed and uploaded, or I shouldn't say uploaded, installed uh, with various cloud providers that we get faster, easier access to that stuff. So, um, you know, it, it, and much sooner than what you would normally get on 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 prem. And so, in that context, so long as you set things up correctly, um, you should get comparable and sometimes better performance. But again, it, it all it all also depends on what you want to pay for too. So, 
yeah, that's always the rub with uh, cloud computing, I suppose. Um, thanks for the answer. Um, that uh, I think I'll move on to the next question. Um, so the this is from Jack Selmeyer. Um, the are the runs that you conduct for the test beds um, are those cheap enough? Uh, this is related to a question that was already asked. Um, but are those cheap enough that you could run and maintain runs, maybe one per day, just to uh, peruse those nine members' output? Or is this limited to certain times of the year because it's just too expensive otherwise? Yeah, so the <clears throat> comment we had there um, was basically, you know, we, uh, as developers, we'd certainly like to have, you know, this running more regularly, but it also requires uh, developer time to kind of keep an eye on things. And right now our priority is getting a DA system constructed, built, and um, you know, all the, you know, do shakedown and that sort of thing on cloud. So we're ready for the winter weather experiment later. Um, and so that's kind of where we're devoting our time and resources uh, at the moment. Um, but that, once that's ready and running and the exact configuration is still TBD, um, that will be running in, in real time more regularly. And I expect, um, that we'll probably be doing more cloud-like development more regularly in the future and distributing things like we demoed uh, in the past test beds. So in the short term, the very short term, no, but I think we're marching along in that direction as time goes on. Great, thanks for all that. Um, so with that, I think we've gotten through the backlog of questions from this morning. Um, I guess I'll I'll start the rest of the open period by opening the floor up to any questions that anyone uh, might not have asked yet, um, whether that be the the trainees or the presenters or just anyone had a point or a question. Um, feel free to raise your hand and uh, and ask away. Uh, yeah, Christina, go ahead. I think that we heard an excellent set of talks this morning from Jeff, Jacob, and Lucas on all of the cool stuff that's happening at each of the centers. And, and I'm curious how outside a tutorial session like this, we might stay up to date on all the stuff that's going on with the short range weather app as it's going through a pretty significant development process. Jacob. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's, you know, I need to think about this one a little bit more, but I, I think off the top of my head, my, my response would be to get engaged on GitHub and things like that, you know, get involved with making your PRs and pulling the code down you know, and then in uh, those sorts of things, and it's all a little bit vague, but also, you know, at, at regular community meetings too. So a good example, now the abstract deadlines have passed, but, um, you know, the AMS annual meeting, there's now it's becoming a regular thing to have a UFS type session. And, you know, that's an opportunity in a way in which, you know, if you're, if you're not presenting something, you can certainly attend, and get up to date on all the things that are going on. Um, there are also other venues out there. There's the UFS community webpage um, and, and so on, where you can kind of go and get updates and get exposed to new stuff uh, as well. I think there may be some mailing lists and, and, and stuff and whatnot. So things are, things are spinning up and getting more mature as time goes on. Um, off the top of my head, those are a couple of the things that sort of immediately jump to mind um, if anything else comes up. I can think of between now and when we wrap up, I'll certainly pass it along. Yeah, people can sign up for the UFS seminars as well, um, which is a great way to learn uh, new development. Jacob, you gave one <laughs> recently. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just mention that, um, uh, like Jacob said, the, uh, we're encouraging people to, you know, through PRs, merge their con contributions back into the main repository and things like that. We don't have really a, a centralized uh, hub, aside from the built-in GitHub forks. Uh, you can obviously see when other people have forked and are doing development. Um, but we are kind of uh, 
we don't have really a formalized process, but we are in communication with groups uh, at NOAA EMC and uh, GSL. And um, we definitely encourage people to, if they have not, um, if they have contributions and are doing development that uh, they are interested in contributing back in any way, um, we do encourage them to reach out um, at, to us at DTC and maybe in the future as Epic comes online, they will kind of take over the, um, the code management role from, uh, from the groups that are doing it currently. So um, we, we do hope that in the future, in addition to obviously conference talks and, and UFS seminars, um, we will have more of a, a, a centralized hub for where people can collaborate and uh, learn about the different contributions that are going on to the whole system. All right, thanks, thanks for that uh, question, Christina. That was great. Um, any other uh, uh, questions from the crowd? Um, whether about the talks today or even talks on previous days. Um, yes, Christiane, go ahead. Yeah, I have, I have two questions. Uh, one is about the governance. So if you have a great idea, a new physics routine, who decides whether this will ever go into the model in, in the long run, maybe as even an, as an operational piece? And what role is EPIC playing? I think that needs a little bit of clarification. Maybe even it's unclear right now, but I, I would like to hear your perspective. It's a two great questions. And I, I believe um, the for answer to your first question is actually gonna depend because you mentioned specifically physics schemes. And I know that those are, are being handled through CCPP. So I'm not sure if uh, one of the CCPP people wants to uh, speak up about that. I can, um, if you is not on the call. So currently there's a, a process in place where we are coming up with a CCPP physics governance boards, so let's say, or a committee with people who are engaged, who are contributing from the various institutions, um, will define what the process is. Um, right now, as right now, it's just like, okay, we basically have the last say, but of course, we always go back to, to confirm with EMC whether the stuff that we put in is, is okay, and if they want this or not. And um, for certain schemes where we have active engagement of the primary developer, like Thompson Microphysics, we always require the approval from, from Greg as well, if there are any changes made to the scheme. So the idea would be to have a to have the primary developer of schemes available, those who maintain it, if it's if that's not the same person um, for for an institution, there are several schemes that are not where the where EMC, for example, is not the primary developer, but they maintain it these days because they use it in operations. And then there are other schemes that are more or less abandoned at the moment because no one's really taking care of them. And it's not really clear what the governance process for this is. So yeah, no clear answer, but um, the process in place, or at least we're working towards having a, a set of rules for that. Great. And EPIC? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so EPIC will be predominantly um, um, responsible for the, for the app level and maybe the UFS weather model level but not so much for the individual components underneath. That's at least as how I understand it. Yeah, I'd, I'd also add that, you know, Epic is really being spun up to help uh, developers contribute back to the, uh, the repositories and to involve the general community and to give people the option to download the code and, and to help with uh, running the cloud, for example, is one of the big uh, topics in the first year. But in terms of, you know, operational decisions, that's not going to involve Epic. That's going to be something that's going to have to come from, uh, you know, NOAA, EMC, GSL, NSSL, those who are involved in working on uh, on the RFS. Um, and so those decisions will come from those, those teams specifically. Uh, you know, the CAM application team leads, Jacob and Curtis have... Uh, the last more or less say on that as well. And Jacob, you can add anything here on that topic. I don't know that I have much to add. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, if, go ahead, Jake. Oh, I was, oh, no, you go ahead. I was just going to say I was at one of the planning meetings uh, as Dom was and Jamie. And uh, 
they have a long way to go. They need to learn first what the, the apps are all about. Um, they had kind of decided on their own what they want to do, the Raytheon yeah. part of things. And then, you know, it was kind of a shock to us, which, we, you know, they wanted to start with, for example, containerization, which is a priority, but not a top priority. Um, so, on the, and they go in six week cycles of um, development. I think the next one, it, it'll be much better. This first one was a little bit disorganized because it wasn't clear how priorities were decided on. Um, so, hopefully, the next cycle, everyone will be much more on the same page and they'll be much more aligned with what NOAA or DTC want to do. Thank you. Yep. All right, thank, yeah, thanks for the great question. Um, and as you can tell, many many things are just undecided at this point. And we, we will definitely be updating documentation and making sure the community can actually find this information. Um, definitely check in on, especially the uh, GitHub repository wikis, because we try to always keep information about you know, who code managers are, how code management works, and what procedures are available, um, or what procedures are needed for um, contributing, making contributions back. Yep. And just to follow up on that and to follow up on Christina's good question earlier, uh, I popped in the general Slack channel, um, just a bunch of links to how to stay engaged. One of those has the link to the main code page and then the links to the wikis are embedded therein. Um, so that should hopefully be a good point of entry for everybody. Yeah, great point. I, I should have also pointed out the, the ufscommunity.org page is kind of the, the hub for, for information. Um, so yeah, you can also find not even just development information, but general information about the UFS past, present, and future. Okay, so we have a, a few minutes left in the open uh, discussion session. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I do have a, a Christiana, is that a, a new question? Okay, okay, yeah, go ahead. When is the next release? The development has been so, um, well, rapid, I guess. Uh, it would be good to have frequent releases. What's the plan for that, for the short range weather app, maybe or even the medium range weather app? Yeah, another great question. Uh, so the release schedule will now be up to Epic. Um, I have heard that they are planning to release the short range weather app probably within the next year. So I, but that's about all I know. I know they were going to do one about six months after their contract started and then another one 12 months later. I think the plan is to start with the medium range weather. So I'm guessing the short range weather will probably be more about a year from now. But that is on their plate at this point. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty with Epic spinning up. Um, as you can see, Christian. So uh, we'll, we'll see. All right. Thanks for all the all the great questions. Um, I'll put out a, a last call. We have one minute left in this session, um, and then we'll have a a lunch break followed by well, I guess kind of the the end of the formal uh, training session. Um, there will be uh, some of us will be around after lunch to help with uh, people who are working on. Uh, finishing up the uh, in-person uh, training, um, sorry, practice sessions. Um, but uh, yeah, aside from that, um, I'm not sure if the, the organizers would like to say anything to the attendees and the presenters. I, I'll certainly throw out my thanks to everybody who's contributed, um, not just uh, the presenters, but people out over on the CISL side, uh, who, uh, such as Brett, who helped us behind the scenes. Um, and Jamie and Jeff, I'll throw it over to you if there's other things you'd like to say. Yeah, I mean, I just, just echo that. Thanks all the presenters, subject matter experts, uh, participants uh, for dialing in every day, um, for Brett for organizing this uh, uh, with the Zoom uh, platform. Um, 
it's been great. I think it's been really worthwhile. We've gotten a lot of uh, interaction and just keep in mind, everything's gonna be available online after uh, this uh, is over. You can view all the talks. Um, the practical session uh, is available online as well. If you wanna share that with other collaborators, other colleagues, they can run that on their own. Uh, if you have further question, technical questions, please feel free to post them on the UFS forum. Uh, there are a number of different categories where you can post questions there and, and SMEs will, will address those there. Um, so yeah, just thank everyone for your time here. Yeah, nothing further to add. Uh, it's been stated very well. So I'll just say again, thank you to everyone that's um, been involved in making this happen. It's been a great week. Um, it was great to see how many people actually registered and were interested in attending this as well. Um, so there's there's a lot of you that um, we hope to see uh, in the future as developers and contributors to this system. So really appreciate your time this week and, and thank you all. So I guess with that, we can um, take our lunch break for those of you that are coming back this afternoon to um, do the hands-on practice session. It is optional, it's totally up to you. We don't have any new additional in, um, sessions to work through, it'd just be if you wanna try some new things, uh, play around with it a little bit more. Uh, for those of you that are not doing the hands-on practice, thank you so much again for being here. And um, yeah, like Jeff said, please um, keep in contact through the UFS forum, but we will also have the Slack page up um, if you, if there's anything that you'd like to post there, feel free. Um, we can continue to monitor that as well. So thank you all.